Is but that, could you imagine though, if, if everything had to vibrate and you had to feel it in order for it to work? That would, that would be, be some messed up world that you live it in. It would be trippy, man. Yeah. Be falling off of shelves everywhere around the world. Bookshelves would never work. How would bookshelves work? They'd all be laid on their back. <laughs> it wouldn't work. It wouldn't work. A ki the kitchen would be a nightmare. All your glasses falling off the top everything shelves. Everything would be a nightmare. Yeah. Just walking to work would be a nightmare. Getting everything would be nailed would be down. Going like... to sleep would be a nightmare. Or oh, do you... Nailed down? The nail's vibrating. And it would just wiggle itself out. <laughs> We'd probably adjust. Maybe like... we have adjusted. Oh, shit. It was at this moment he knew. Oh, man. Mind blown. And we're live in five, four, three, two... One. We're back. Two guys, one ball. If you haven't seen the first show, it's going to be available at the end of the, the show. <laughs> Subscribe on the channel, you'll see the other one. We had a great conversation reviewing Living Life Larger. First episode of a brand new show on YouTube. Yeah, it was pretty entertaining. It was uh, pretty decent. That's where we came up with the idea of discussing universal loss. Yeah, so I think it was in the last maybe third of it where we kind of mentioned how valuable it might be to run through some of the universal laws. It's something that, if I'm being frank, I'm not necessarily familiar with. Ofe. What? Ofe. Ofe. Familiar. Sure. So I'm not too familiar <laughs> with uh, the universal laws mm -hmm. that uh, you, you, we are alluded to in the book or that you've mentioned in the past. That's cool. You know, sometimes uh, something can take many forms and many shapes. But it'll be interesting to see what your perception is, because I understand. So actually, what would be a good starting point is for you to kind of talk through what you know or what you've taken from the book or what your understanding is on a very high level. I mean, your experience with the book, your relationship. So as with the I'm book. aware, there are seven core universal laws. I will go through an introduction in the book first, actually, just to explain what universal laws are, just to give a premise before we start this. But just to plug the book that we're going to be looking at, this book here. Yep, yeah, that one there. Mm -hmm. um, this is by Jennifer O'Neill. It talks about the 18 powerful laws and the secret behind manifesting your desires. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I've never read the book. I've never heard of the book until now. I've read and the book. I thought it was a good standing point to actually start discussing this. Let's get straight into it. Let's do it, man. Okay. But are you gonna just, what are you doing now? You're gonna read straight out of the book. I'm gonna read you just the opening part of the what oh, is right. universal laws. Then we can start discussing universal laws. Cool. Let's do then it. Then we can go through them. Initially, we weren't gonna do all 18. We we're gonna just do seven main core ones, which you can find on the internet somewhere. Sure. But like I said to you, the premise of all these laws they actually interrelate and interact, interact with each other, and they're important to understand. The more you understand, the more you know what you don't know. Yeah. But the more you understand, the more you can apply pragmatically into your life. I cool. think that's what a lot of people are looking for. They're looking for things that they can actually do rather than just think about, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, that's actually, you know what? Sometimes people, you know, sometimes we want the things that we don't realize we want. So sometimes people... I drink to that. Sometimes people, they want an answer, but they don't necessarily want to make the effort to change. <laughs> Apple and whiskey, huh? Um, some people, they want the answer, but they don't want to necessarily be able have to put it into action. Sometimes they just want to say, oh, I know this, or I can solve your problems. It's like, okay, but how come you're not incorporating it into your own life? So sometimes people just want to feel the power that comes with the knowledge, but not, necess not necessarily apply or execute that power in their own life. And then from my understanding, from all the stuff that I've gone through and experienced, etc., we want, and I've read this summer as well, we want teachers who, as you've said, have been through it, done it, have applied it, and have shown results of it themselves. So you don't want to go to someone that's teaching you how to be rich if they're not rich themselves. True, true. Because at the end of the day, it's like that leap of faith you have to have in your own knowledge when there isn't a, a guiding force, a, a guiding person, a guiding energy. If there's no one leading the way or showing you that they've, they've applied it in their own lives and it's, it works. You don't have like a personal trainer that's unfit. Yeah. That wouldn't work for you, right? No. It's almost like you aspire to be like the person that's informing you. They're a role of... model, yeah. yeah. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's crack on. Shall I? Yeah. Okay, so I'll read it. Stop me anytime you want. Cool. So what are universal laws? I'm going to put on a slight American accent for this. In order for you to understand how the manifestation process works in its entirety. So I think this is actually focused on the law of attraction and that whole buzz, that whole buzz, law of attraction, that whole buzz that came through with um, the secret 
and the other stuff that came out in the last 10 years or something where people are becoming more aware of the law of attraction which is one of the universal laws but it's one of many and without understanding the rest of them you can't apply the law of attraction in its full entirety okay let's yeah, let's blast through the it's important for you to have a general understanding of the universal laws you don't need to memorize them or even know each one completely however there are some very key points which you must learn these key points will help you make sense of why it all works the way it does they will help you understand what formula lies behind the manifestation process so what are universal laws exactly so initially what's your impression of a universal law um, to be honest, there on is a non-philosophical basis. There isn't much that doesn't really give much information or insight into. No, no, what, no, not from the book. I mean, I'm asking you. Um, when you heard the term universal law for the first time, whether it was last week or ten years ago. So universal laws, uh, in my mind, yeah. straight away people think of physics. Okay. People think of the immutable laws of physics. Um, Good word. And astrophysics, I know. And essentially, um, the known obviously there's still so much in the scientific realm we don't know but the known physical laws the immutable laws are considered universal laws that they are applicable here or anywhere else in the yeah, universe so the term universal is yeah it applies to the universe everywhere in the, our, our universe yeah, yeah and with, then without is fail something that because a rule can be broken right but then aren't laws meant to be broken that's a human concept isn't it yes yeah, of human laws isn't it yeah yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's almost like uh, you know humans looked at the nature of the universe mm -hmm. and the way that those are immutable, and they wanted to create something similar. So they say that you know, like our laws, in the same way that gravity will never flip on itself, and you know everything falls away from the planet. The way that that is known, people should know not to kill or to steal or to whatever it is, or you know evade tax or whatever it is. Yeah. Everything in existence has a physical and spiritual component to them. Here are some characteristics of a physical component. A physical component consists of mass and matter, so physics. Uh, primarily things which most people can see and touch, such as furniture, <laughs> trees, houses, cars, water, etc. Physical components are direct dictated by what are called physical laws, such as the law of gravity and the law of motion. Kind of what you just sure. said. Most people are somewhat familiar with these laws because... These subjects are touched upon when you attend school. I'm going to skip a little bit. Okay, here are some characteristics of a spiritual component. A spiritual component primarily deals with energy. Energy is something you can feel with your spiritual body. These are. This is where we start going into stuff now, right? Yeah, that was a very uh, about turn. One more time. Energy is something you can feel with your spiritual body. Right. Okay. I think we should dive into the laws. I think that everything will come out with that. But I think I'm just more aware that there's going to be people that are potentially watching this or listening to this that have no idea of this at all. Just to give them a slight mm. basis of what's a spiritual body. When they say feel from your spiritual body, what's that? How is that different to my own body? Okay, so, yeah, okay. So how do we keep it simple? Do we keep it simple of as long as you have emotions and, <laughs> and are aware of your emotions, I think then you are aware that there is something going on? I think if we dive into the individual laws, as we talk through it, there'll be points where we just, you know, maybe reference, for example, with spiritual bodies, you could take that as almost, um, you know, like in, in Hindu scripture, for example, uh, or in Hindu. Mahabharata. Do what now? Nothing. You're freestyling. That's an Indian dish, my local takeaway. Anyways, um, it's more like I think we should dive into the laws and then unpack everything as we go along because mm -hmm. then you've got something to tie it to. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way we should approach it. Okay. I'm still going to finish a little bit more. All right, go on. Listen, Andy, you've proven that you can still read it. I, I haven't because I've I tripped on some words already. Spiritual components are dictated by what we call universal laws. How do they become laws? These laws are conclusions based on many, many years of repeated experiments and observations thus being universally accepted into the scientific community as a law. I don't know how I feel about that. So she's saying that basically she's, she said spiritual laws are universal laws and that basically they've, because of the, the, the last bit there kind of implies that they've undergone the same kind of rigor and that same kind of tried and tested methodology that you would actually expect to hear about physical laws or physics. But it's, uh, yeah, go on. Let's, let's keep going with this. Okay, last thing here is, why should any of this matter to you? She says, because it makes your life a whole lot easier when you understand universal laws. 
And that's the reason why I went into it as well. I kind of thought that if I understand what governed the place or the reality that I live in, and I live by those rules or laws or conditions, I'm going to get much more out of it. And honestly, I believe that's true mm. in my in my perspective. Yeah, sure. Sure. If it works, it works. Einstein quote, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. Expecting, and expecting a diff different, different result. results. Yeah. Universal law number one. Cool. Can we time code this this time on the uh, podcast? Yeah, yeah. The law of one or oneness. The law of one or oneness. Everything is connected. We are all one. Okay. Put the book down. Let's talk about it. That's what I'm thinking. Start talking. No, 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 no. I can't talk to you with a book in your hand, mate. Let's just engage me. Engage me. I'm just making sure there's nothing else in here. It's like your crib notes there, up. man. I want, I want it off the top of, top of the dome, man. Oh, no, you can start. I'm waiting for you to put the book down. Engage me. You're just reading your homework. Come on. There's a lot here on Universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just Universal cool. We, we've, got, we've got the law. Let's just talk through it. Let's talk about what, what does it mean to you? The law of one or oneness. Everything is connected. Put the book down, motherfucker. I have to repeat it. Don't forget what the book says. I no, I have to repeat the law so we're clear of what the law is before the we start. The law of to... one or oneness. No, but it's the part about being connected or connectedness that I'm going to repeat. Sure. Okay. Talk to me. What, my understanding, what does it mean to you? My understanding is that everything, everything is connected. Mm-hmm because everything came from the same thing or the same source and everything is a representation of that same source in a different vibration of energy okay everything is a representation of that one source in a different vibrational energy vibration of energy yeah okay i can't really disagree with that i think for um any any viewers at home or wherever they are sitting on a train killing time um, I, think we should, um, <laughs> I think we should unpack it a little bit. So, Carney doesn't, he's studied, he's clued up, but yeah. Mutual so, friend, mutual friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, friend. So, yeah, so if you're going to talk about the source, so what's the source? For me, that means the, the singularity, the Big Bang uh, from which it all started. You uh, interrupt or correct me if your understanding differs. So, you said from the source. So of course we don't we don't know hardly anything. Mm-hmm. We can only assume by our perspective and our understanding, mm-hmm. and what makes us comfortable is our own truths. My truth is that in this reality, yeah. nothing exists without relationship. Sure, you can't take anything out of context or out of connection with the with the things. It wouldn't exist without the things around yeah. it. So if yeah. you imagined nothing but white space. And there is nothing to touch or feel. All you can visualize, and again, this is so crass, but all you can visualize is white space. There is nothing to compare yourself with if you are you are nothing but white yourself, yeah. as in the color white. And there's nothing around you but white. And wherever you go, move, even sounds and feelings, if it was all white, there's no relationship. So technically, nothing exists because there's nothing to relate to yeah, as yeah, being yeah. different with. Yeah. So, for example, if you if in order to judge distance, you need enough contrast between objects. Yeah, you need two locations. points to have a distance in the first place. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Otherwise, so there if you is strip no distance. that back out, yeah. So it's yeah. basically you're talking about void right now. You're talking about void, empty. Like it's a good, it's a good, yeah. In the human terms, it's a good um, visualization of what yeah, we're yeah, talking about. Yeah. The void, the emptiness, the nothingness. But it was uh, a conscious nothingness, mm. conscious nothingness, and it has the power. It had the power. It has the power to do whatever it wants, however it wants, supreme being. So in order to have a existence, it creates something else. But with the unlimited potential to create whatever can be thought of, whatever can be imagined, the process started. Call it the Big Bang, call it whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Now there is a, a whole sea of things to have relationships with in different forms. That's why I'm saying there is a source, a point of starting that everything comes from that has a differentiation to the original source by means of, as we understand it, in the physical terms, vibration. Sure. All so, matter vibrates at different levels. Sure. So it's really like you've got, you've got there's, a, there's a distinction to be made there in terms of uh, source and manifestation of the source. What do you mean? 
as in you've got the source and then you've got the manifestation of the source. There's a key distinction you're making there in that you have this void, this emptiness and mm -hmm. out of that. Which is still the source. Yeah, it's all source. Yes. It's all, but the point is, it's like I'm in my head, I'm still playing devil's advocate. I'm playing the skeptic and kind of saying, you know, if we take it from a quite crass, but a purely scientific viewpoint, you could say from the singularity at one point, I guess you can't say one point in time, you know, whenever it, however long ago it was or whatever, however that relates, but there was a singularity where everything was contained into, you know, something the size of a pinhead. It Every, doesn't need, I, size doesn't even matter. Yeah, I know, because it's, it's relative. relative. Yeah, Again, yeah. so it kind of loses all context and yeah. you know, it kind of loses any meaning because there's nothing, what's it in relation to? It's almost to, unfathomable what, for what was, human yeah, mind to think of What was around place. it, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's almost like the, 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 the universal egg, you know? Egg life. From which everything, <laughs> shout out to Jin. Um, the universal egg from which everything came from. So at some point, you know, no matter how much uh, physical space and distance is between body bodies, whether celestial bodies with between me and you, between one side of the world or the other, or, you know, f between stars and, you know, galaxies, everything was at once in that proximity. So whether it's individuals on the other side of the planet or whether it's galaxies or stars, whatever the physical distance that we perceive now, really everything came from this point where everything was as tightly tightly knit as as inconceivable you can't really conceive in which way you know every molecule or atom or electron or whatever physical forces in the universe were contained in that space we can't even conceive it but the point is is that yeah at one point everything was touching you know and that uh, physical emptiness and physical space is really an illusion because there's so much in between the visible bodies that is there but we can't perceive so really, we're constantly... Well, this is the thing as well, though, isn't it? Because... I don't know where you're going with this. It's a sprawling subject. Let's go back to your point. Let's go back to the law. So if you understand that everything came from the idea of in order to exist, a relationship needs to be present. And in order to create that, there are now experiences that are had by sentient conscious beings mm -hmm. existing as a... Incarnation of the source, is that the right word? A manifestation of the source, yeah. I'm not sure about that word, but okay. Yeah. That then can actually experience what's being created without the knowledge that we were actually responsible for the creation. Yeah, okay. If anyone's listening and they're not watching the video, Dara is thinking really hard. Hmm. <laughs> So the get, idea you know of is, the law of the, oneness the, is that we all come from a, a they, same thing. I get it, but a same you know, point, I don't disagree like with you, but there's so many assumptions weaved into the statements you're making. And yeah, of course, because we can't prove. You can only know. Sure. But I want to unpack those assumptions okay. when I'm listening to you. Because if some basically, if you... Fire shot, fire shot. <laughs> if you were to... I know you're not... Well, you're not exp you're not talking about it to convince someone, but if you were to explain to someone, maybe mm -hmm. something. You, I, I think it's one of those things that you learn about, and then you feel it, mm -hmm. and the feeling proves the lear the learning, mm -hmm. whatever you've absorbed, whatever knowledge or information you've absorbed. But if somebody hasn't felt that, how would you explain it to them in a way that they can go away? And pay attention to that feeling and see and and you know or pick up on that feeling when it comes into their life feeling of of that interconnectedness because a lot i don't of, think i don't think I, you feel it i don't think it's a feeling i say it's a knowing it's not a feeling because you don't feel like you're connected to the table but you can feel the table when you touch it yeah but i don't mean a physical feeling then what are you saying a non-physical feeling which is how do you explain that like it's not even an emotional state, but it's it's more of an awareness. It's an awareness that, for example, that's not, you know, a yellow. That is basically all the light bouncing off, and you know, only the light of yellow is being absorbed, but everything else is being refracted. Or, for example, the fact that there's so much empty space between the electrons in this table that this is 99% empty space, space, and it's just the illusion of molecules. So just in the same, same way, same as your brain. 
same as my brain and it's just that the same way that you have a, a knowledge which ties into the feeling of you know it's like I'll give you an example right um, there was a study where this guy wore glasses that flipped so you know when the eye processes uh, light and imagery it actually does it upside down but the brain adapts at a very early age to self correct and do it the right orient the orient the right way up but what happened is this guy he got glasses that basically flipped it back the other way around like it is is actually received and within a week he adjusted or within two weeks he adjusted so his brain adapted for that difference in visual stimuli so the point is our perceptions you know there's a whole training uh, of philosophy that talks about doubting your perception and it says that basically things like mathematics is the example that they use is that even though your senses may fail you there's certain logical truths that can't be unbroken such as one plus one is two and those kind of things so it basically you know there's there's it's called rationalism in philosophy and wh whichever position you pick it can always it, you can always pick holes in it and pick arguments and flaws with it but it's an interesting way of thinking of the world in that basically it's it, you know if you follow that path down um that you that your senses can fail you and that your senses aren't perfect you know and we all know we've all had those you know whether it's bear goggles whether it's you misheard someone whether it's you know you felt someone touch you on the shoulder and you turn there's no one there you're like you know and we all know about our senses kind of tricking us or failing us or optical illusions or whatever but the logical extreme of that is solipsism which is like how can you trust anything of your senses you know but that's that's a very extreme position but the point is this the point is is that there's some knowledge that is basically irrefutable regardless of what your senses are telling you so if you can deduce that one plus one is two it's something you know and you feel that you feel the knowing you know the logic of that you you know it first that one plus one is two but then you feel the knowing of that and it becomes ingrained it becomes immutable so the way you're talking about things such as you know uh the source and um the way that you were describing it before it's like you're talking about knowing i'm talking about the feeling of the knowing but i really want to unpack it more. i think it's a personal journey okay because the i think the point of the law is just to understand that let's say what what if everything was connected Rather than like, so you have to get to that space where you understand your interconnectedness with the universe and everything around you. Yeah, I don't think it's possible for you to give somebody a way or a route to find it. Yeah, it's almost like it's a personal uh, journey or a personal moment. Yeah, that you just come into the realization. Yeah, of all things being in some way connected, and the moment you get to that space, and then like you say, it becomes a feeling. Yeah, your relationship with everything around you becomes different sure for example those that um don't kill life any life maybe they you know they grew up and they were killing ants but then at one point in their belief system or their culture or their religion they were taught the idea that you know what all life is sacred yeah or we're all part of the same thing suddenly they realize that this is an extension of me or i have a responsibility towards all life around me sure so from this moment onwards they don't eat meat they care for where they walk and they don't put jeopardy into the way of life in any way at all sure so i think with relation to what you're saying yeah i can't give it a a root or a yeah, feeling yeah, sure. all i can say is that the premise of the law yeah. is is that important in order to move forward with the other laws okay with the idea that if everything is connected mm -hmm. then there must be a formula here of some kind and that formula must be expanded in the other laws okay and understanding that the idea of oneness then we can then relate the, the idea of oneness and maybe unpack it further as we go through other laws because then it starts to mean more okay. rather than just talking about it as we are sure okay so it's probably worth we can move on but just before we do i think it should be to safe. highlight it <laughs> have you got a highlight pen with you no flop so i think to be honest that law is something that anybody would find it very difficult to disagree with so short of waffling on and getting distracted by he saved you the first part of 
you know, the first chapter of the book, I think it's something that people will find very difficult to disagree with purely because of the fact that the oneness of the universe and the idea of that as a concept is well known around the world in different expressions and different religions. And generally there's an awareness where people know that at least some other people believe that there is a oneness to the universe. But even the idea of saying we have a relationship as yeah. in we're friends. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That already is a connectedness. True. So again, even but on any level, you can find the idea of oneness sure. by anything you look at. Yeah. It's how far you take it. Sure. So I think in order to move past it, I think I just want to make clear that with that law, it's very hard to disagree with because of the reasons I just said for the for people who believe and for people who don't necessarily believe in... Or maybe understand. In in Okay, sure. Um a way of putting it that is quite, probably quite difficult to disagree with is that we are all united by reality and we are all united by existence and life and life yes we're talking about humans right yeah if we yeah. well i was talking very generally about everything in existence Even being, the table. being everything okay as in the 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 connection we are connected by the fact that we are all in existence mm -hmm. physically at least at the least so let's continue universal law, law number two. two yeah the law of vibration the law of vibration, everything in the universe vibrates or offers a vibration. Cool. I don't think there's anything to say about that. This still goes back to the law of oneness and what I just said anyway. Sure. Because we, but what I'm saying is that we need to say something about it in order for those who have never come across this idea before. Because with all information and knowledge, you build upon your knowledge as you go through your life experience. Okay. And you might be more versed than me in some things. I might be more versed in sure. stuff than you. Sure, sure. And as a result, people that are listening and watching this, yeah. they're going to be like, what the hell are you talking about vibrations and vibrations and stuff? It's like, what? what? Okay. So, How do you break that down into a way that, again, people understand yeah. that everything's vibrating? When I can look at this and this and it's not moving. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. So basically, everything that we can see is made up of molecules. Molecules are made up of atoms. Atoms. Atoms are made up of electrons, neutrons, protons, and then you get to subatomic particles. Quarks. 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 Uh, and, you know. So, when you basically go down in building blocks uh, at a more f um, discrete level, so basically, as, as you go more and more into the detail of the universe, and I can't imagine it, I can't imagine that anyone would, would doubt it, but there's equipment scientific equipment in existence such as really advanced telescopes um, and very advanced sensors that basically can pick up on the smallest building blocks of the universe um, you know I think of CERN as well and what just, tell, just tell me about the vibrations yeah so basically everything when you get down to a, a small enough level is vibration that's all there, that's all there is to it everything in the universe are let's, is, let's, is let's, make it, let's make it more simple Let's make it more simple. Well, everyone knows what a vibration is. But what I'm saying is, yeah, let's talk on a bigger scale. Because I think when you start talking on a very small, discrete scale, yeah. people will get lost. But when you talk about, for example, fire. Right. Fire. Fire. Fire vibrates fire. at a quite a high... Well, light. Let's look at light, sound, and then physical matter. That's okay, easy. But light is right? a difficult one because that's both a particle and a wave. But anyways, go on. Continue. But it's all vibration. Start, yeah, it's all, go on, it's all vibration. And you're talking more quantum now as well, which doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> so the table mm. has a much more dense or slower vibration than sound. Sound, which obviously is a very good way of describing it, everything is vibrating as we let air move out of our mouth mm -hmm. and then it vibrates every molecule, every atom, every air particle around us in yeah. order for somebody else to pick up on that sound. Sure which then is translated into an electrical signal in your ear and then passed into your brain yeah. that you make connections with. Sure. Light is an even higher vibration than sound. So it's still the same thing, it's a much higher vibration. But when we start to go into the idea of, it just says everything vibrates in it, or it says offers a vibration. Everything in the universe vibrates or offers a vibration. Yeah. When you start looking at the more spiritual aspects of things, we spoke about the spiritual body and feeling, emotions also vibrate but they vibrate in a different way because they're not physical. But they have, like you say, waves. They, they, sadness, anger, fear are very dense vibrations or waves. Whereas happiness, love, give me another positive emotion. I'm out. Excitement. Excitement, enthusiasm, very high vibration. 
Sure. So when we start to understand it like this, then we can, again, start to see how this starts to relate to the other building blocks as well as we move down the line of universal laws. Okay. I think there's a misconception there that could be made because it sounds like, for example, if you're happy, you're higher vibration. If you're sad, you're low vibration. Higher or lower, yeah. Yeah. But then so if you, it can be maybe misconstrued. Like if you're angry, mm -hmm. you're more energetic. You're more physically volatile. Mm -hmm. You're more, yeah, your adrenaline's pumping. You're more active. So some people would say, but Andy, isn't being angry higher energy as well? But that's when we're talking about, I think, I think you're talking about physical, as in you're talking about the physical manifestation yeah. of a non-physical vibration, mm. which is emotion. Mm. So again, it's, it's without talking about the spiritual body yeah. and how that is present in our experience. Yeah. Just understanding that it's two different things. Sure. The physical manifestation and the non-physical manifestation. Sure. If you're aware that there's these two components of your being, then you can start to realize so, that the vibrations that exist are above and beyond our understanding of reality itself. Sure. So it's not really about our physical energy levels. Or emotions of, we're talking about. Yeah. Okay. It's not, it's more of, more of asking you the question, but yeah. it's not really about the, the physical energy levels of how hyped up or how... Hype. Hype, hype, or how lethargic and like worn out, and you know, like laid, you know, moping around the house. Or it's not about that. Not it's when it about comes, the fact. Yeah, not that, when it comes to an emotional feeling. Yeah, or the, the the energy or the vibrations associated with the emotions. There's a <laughs> distinction being made between uh, physical energy levels and being hyped up and being, you know, really energetic. Whether mm -hmm. it's through anger or happiness, you know, you're ecstatic, you're about jumping around the room. Or whether it's sadness or, you know, feeling lethargic or you're feeling like you're, you know, you've just broken up, you're moping around the house or something like that. We're not talking about physical energy levels. We're talking about emotional, spiritual, yeah, what or, saying, or what really the, 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 the impact of emotions on spiritual energy levels is what you're really saying. There is a relationship between non-physical vibration and physical vibration. What's non-physical vibration? Emotion is an example of non-physical vibration. So what is vibrating? As in, as in it's not, it's not. What's vibrating? You can't touch an emotion. Sure, but you can't touch the electromagnetic spectrum. You can barely explain an emotion. But you can't touch the electromagnetic spectrum. But you can feel it, right? You, and you can observe you it. You notice the absence of Yeah, I guess you can feel it, yeah. Or you notice the absence of it, or you notice when it's not working, or you notice... But you know it's present, so don't you? Like you say, you can put you, something into something, energetically speaking, and you can see it respond or react. Yeah. Yeah, but that's because the sensor is an extension of our body, not because we our sensory organs. Well, there are parts of the brain and the body that can pick up on magnetic fields, but it's not necessarily conscious. It's things like the sense of balance, sense of orientation. For example, what they did is they put a, a helmet with magnets fixed to it all around it, and they put it on a um, subject, and they found that the person would experience out-of-body experiences when the magnetic field and the electromagnetic spectrum around them was disrupted. So it's like, for example, when there are electromagnetic disruptions in the world, entire flocks of birds can lose their sense of orientation. They start fly flying towards uh, the wrong direction when, you, you know, they're, they're migrating and that kind of thing. So we do pick up on it, but not in a conscious or apparent way. Like but I can see that you're... Isn't that still somewhat physical range. though? As in, like you say, we can... So this is what I'm saying. You're saying non-physical vibrations and I'm asking you to explain that. It's not something that we can... No, I'm saying what is a non-physical vibration it's not in comparison to a physical? In the respect of, like, you can't measure happiness. What's, you can't put two people, you can say someone's more happy than the other, right? But you can't say he is a happy 10 and he is a happy 5. You can't measure sure. emotion. Sure, it's qualitative. You can, you can view uh, it, you can observe the manifestation of it, yeah. but you can't measure it. Sure. And that's what I'm saying. It's those kind of things that are out of our understanding. Well, this is the thing. I'll, I don't necessarily... So I can't explain it to you in the way of I know it because I don't. What I'm saying is that it's out of our realm of, okay, we understand electromagnetism. Mm -hmm. We understand gravity. We can see its forces. We can respond to that. Yeah. Whereas emotion, we can feel it, mm -hmm. but we can't measure it. Okay. We understand it to an extent. So I'm going to pause you there. So... Pause. The first thing I'm going to mention is some scientists and some people out in the world would disagree with you. I'm not saying it's necessarily myself, but I wouldn't be doing justice to the show or to being a devil's advocate if I didn't mention it. Is the fact that, for example, you're you're already aware, but it's good to say, um, emotions have corresponding hormones which are released into the body, which flood the brain. Which so is a example, manifestation. Sure. And there's, there is a whole question of which follows which. 
and you might have an opinion on that and that's fine but the point is is that for example if you say happiness you can't measure happiness some scientists or some people in the world would potentially disagree with you because they would say that if you were to measure the, the level amount of, of, of uh, amount of hormone in one person's brain if you were somehow magically to put a re receptor some type of little receiver in my brain and your brain and we're both happy you could tell okay this person's got a high level of hormones so it's not about outward expression or manifestation of that emotion but it's really about what's the chemical level but, the but i'm not time, saying i'm not no, saying no, I agree I'm, with that yeah, but, but I'm, I'm, yeah, at know. the same time does your level and my level if we had the same amount leaving us is that the same level sure. or is it a different so, experience but this is the thing now imagine a small amount of that chemical in my head could mean so much more happiness than mm -hmm. a huge amount in your head mm -hmm. but then that comes back to the whole is my idea of red the same as your mm -hmm. idea of red is my idea of blue and we can't we don't really mm -hmm. know because you grow up and you go mom what's that your mom goes that's red and then you identify that as red but how do i know that i perceive red in the same way that you perceive red so that's worth one one half a drink it's just a burp Six. and the kfc man the kfc did the job <clears throat> the the unspecified chicken that we're not sponsored by so the point is is some people would say you can measure emotion which is not necessarily what I'd agree with because there is a un there is a massive amount of uncertainty about which leads to which is it you feel the emotion happiness and then all the hormones come flushing out or is there's a f biological reaction to something and the the hormones come rushing out and then you're like ah oh, I feel happy you know which one comes first um so yeah I, and again it's fair enough if there's not it's something you feel or something you know um but I just felt, thought it'd be interesting to pick up on what is a non-physical vibration because that is contentious I'm not if, saying maybe, I agree or disagree but it's just contentious the, the physical what we can see taste touch feel etc yeah but not, not not even sensory because the physical is more than sensory mm -hmm. it's like there's the um the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see that bumblebees can see ultraviolet mm -hmm. or dogs can see certain you know yeah. or, we're or hearing our range. Yeah. yeah so we're basically seeing through a narrow slit um or we've got every every one of our senses has a narrow range every sense has a a spectrum a broadband range you know and we can only perceive what's mm -hmm. in that physically mm -hmm. through our senses but then you've got animals uh, and creatures that can perceive across that spectrum so it's not really about physical is just what we perceive with our bodies okay, it's, it's what we know to be out let's, there again let's take it crass again as if we're talking to a young person they still come into this and remaining in the physical let's talk about they will say for example this this rod of iron or this rock isn't vibrating okay so basically because just because we can't feel something mm -hmm. vibrating just because mm -hmm. i can't feel this gl glass vibrating in my hand or I can't feel the table vibrating under my hand. It doesn't mean it's vibrating. Because it comes back to your limited senses, right? Exactly. It's because it's imperceivable to mm -hmm. us. It's the same it's so way. Small. Yeah. And if anyone doubts that, if anyone says, well, I can't feel the table shaking, it's like, then you probably don't know how your TV works or how your light bulbs work as well. But that doesn't mean that it's not working. The way is, is but that... could you imagine though, if, if everything had to vibrate and you had to feel it in order for it to work? That would that would be, be some messed up world that you live it in. It would be trippy, man. Yeah. Shit would be falling off of shelves everywhere around the world. Bookshelves would never work. How would bookshelves work? They'd all be laid on their back. <laughs> it wouldn't. Work. It wouldn't fucking work. A, ki a kitchen would be a nightmare. All your glasses falling off the top shelves. Everything shelf. would be a nightmare. Yeah. Just walking to work would be a nightmare. Getting everything would be nailed would be down. Going like... to sleep would be a nightmare. Or oh, do you... nailed down. The nails vibrating. And it would just wiggle itself out. <laughs> We'd probably adjust. Maybe like... we have adjusted. Oh shit! Oh man, mind blown. Right, so let's crack so on. So even the densest of matter is vibrating, but we just cannot conceive it. Yeah, it's imperceivable. But everything is vibrating at some extent. And that's why, going back to the first law, everything is related because there is a relationship that everything seems to have in common, yeah. which is vibration. Yeah. Conscious vibration. Guys, look this up if you want more information. We're not going to go through the whole thing. Yeah, we're not going into astrophysics. It's just okay. there's going to be a lot more interesting laws here that we're going to get to that we'll need more discussion than talking about vibration for half an hour. Yeah, yeah. Okay. This actually gives, by the way, tips of uh, people who are looking for love, people who are looking for money and stuff in the in the book itself. So talk about the law, then I'll talk about solutions for finding what you're looking for in your life, which is a really good way. But it's all about manifestation anyway. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Universal law number three. This is the big one. Law of attraction. 
Okay. The law of attraction, you attract into your life what you are offering vibrationally. Now, before we get into it, let's just point out that this is the law that came out in The Secret, which was a big Australian produced film back, I think, 10 years ago or something like that. Yeah. To which Abraham Hicks was part of that, who a lot of people are aware of Abraham was Hicks he? now. Her. Huh? No, it's a, it's a collective consciousness. It, it doesn't have a being, it's just got a name. Abraham Hicks. Abraham Hicks. Abraham is the name of the consciousness. Abraham Hicks is the the persona okay, that is continue. used for the production of books and sure. etc. Okay. Bob Proctor and a lot of other people also were in the film. But a lot of people are aware now of the law of attraction yeah. because of both The Secret and Abraham Hicks. And then a lot of other practitioners and teachers have now gone into the subject and are trying to teach the law of attraction without understanding or <coughs> giving Monetize. all the info. Well, everyone's got to do something somewhere. You know? True. But yeah, they're trying to teach law of attraction without going into universal laws, which is why I thought this was such a good topic because everyone knows about the law of No, a lot of people know about the law of attraction, but if you don't know about the universal laws, you can't make the law of attraction work in the way you want it to work and as profoundly as you want it to work. <coughs> Lottery. So, so that if you understand these, your life's going to be a lot better. Yeah. So, law of attraction, what do you know so far? So, law of attraction, it depends on what realm, but it's basically... What you look for in the world is what you find more of, is the way that I see it. So it's almost like, but then it's a self, it's like self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like if you're talking to someone. It. It's part of it. If I met you for the first time. You're welcome. And I was in a good mood and you did some good things and some bad things during the conversation. Like maybe you, were irrit you irritate me in some ways, but you made me laugh in some ways. If I was in a good mood, I'd go away and probably think about the good side of you and the good side that was apparent to me, like how you made me laugh. If I was in a shit mood, I'd, go, I'd probably be like, this guy's driving me up the wall. It's probably a right pain in the ass. Don't want to know him. But the point is, is that whatever I'm looking for in people or from situations, it's almost like the mindset you go into something with is what you get back in terms of energy. So if you go into something in a good mood, I'm going to have an open mind. You know, sometimes... Even then, things fuck up. You can go into a meeting thinking you're about to get promoted and you could be you getting the fucking axe. You don't know. Sometimes life is like that. You can't necessarily predict every scenario, but it's generally a rule of thumb is that if you go into a situation with a positive energy or go into a conversation with a positive energy, ten, nine times out of ten, you're going to get that back and the other person will pick up on that energy and think, oh, this person is actually they're good to be around they're not making me feel depressed which is interesting again because you're talking about energy yeah energy relates back to yeah, the law we, of vibration if, if we, yeah so if we use it colloquially I think most people you know talk about oh yeah. that guy's got bad vibes or this, this girl's got fantastic energy about her so yeah. people just talk about they talk about it anyway you know there's, there's a kind of understanding in people that you know, there's a saying that a lot of people are going to be aware of which says opposites attract that's a very rare occurrence when it comes to the law of attraction as far as I'm aware I think opposites attract when we're talking about physical things, such as water is attracted to dry things. When I say attracted to, as in it will absorb into dry things. Or is it the magnetism? Plus and minus will attract, but plus and plus will yeah, yeah, push each other away, yeah. right? But in, in relation to the law of attraction, like attracts like, and it's as simple as that. Like attracts like. So exactly like you were saying, your mood will dictate what is coming towards you. So it's not about you going away and thinking about something. It's about what you come into something with yeah. that you're going to get out of. So this is such, law of attraction is such a big subject anyway. And again, in relation to the other universal laws, it all falls into place. But there's a lot of learning to do. And again, you're not going to learn everything from this, this show. I think we should avoid spending too much time in it for the reason that, first of all, it's been done to death. First of all, uh, second of all, even everyone's got an opinion on it or they've got their own understanding of it. I think we should just spit our take on it and then just move on. Because at the end of the day, I think it's how the law of um, attraction relates to the other laws. Because most people think with the law of attraction, they're going to get an image board up on their wall, they're going to put a Lamborghini there, and then every day they're going to stare at it and wish for it, and somehow magically it's going to fall out their lap or get parked out outside of their house. But really it's about, I think it's about fruition, how to make your dreams a reality, not just how to have a dream and to really focus on a dream. It's about how do you manifest that dream. And then also as well, it's about how the, all the other laws interact and play their part in in working synergistically with the law of attraction mm -hmm. i think i always found so you don't negate the law of attraction yeah yeah 
because some people use the law of attraction and then they're like, oh, this isn't working for me. But as soon as you do it's that, like, as soon as you do that, you're pushing it away. Exactly. As soon as you do that, you're actually telling yourself, okay, I want more of that. Sure, sure. Which negates the whole process. Sure. Doubt is a, uh, what's the word? Buzzkill. Or <laughs> sabotage. Sabotage yeah. is the manifestation. Yeah, in fairness, there is a place for doubt, but it's not necessarily on things which are subjective. If something is subjective... Or not for things that you want. True. Yeah. Sure. So it comes down to just say your bit. What do you think? Yeah, it comes down to is? two things. It comes down to belief and desire, which equates to thoughts and emotions. When you focus your thoughts and you raise yourself to a high vibrational energy status to the walls that thought, and you maintain and hold that consistently, and then, like you say, you start acting from that place. You start to see. The ramifications you start to see the manifestations of that it starts every manifestation within the law of attraction starts with the emotion as in you start to feel better because of the thought so ideally in that respect everything starts with a thought you've got to have a good thought first then the emotion responds to the thought you don't just have a good thought so you don't just feel happy and suddenly you think oh i might win the lottery you generally think oh what would it be like to win the lottery yeah that would feel good and then you start to i don't know I, get, I, I, I kind of get what you're going with here, but if I take something, for example, I'm, I'm thinking how people discover the things that they love doing in their life. How, for example... A but discovery is slightly different to attracting something. But yeah, but I get what... You're, hear me out. All right. So you might have a ballet dancer who's never danced before. I did have a ballet dancer. Not a belly dancer, a ballet dancer. I did say ballet dancer. Right. So you might have a ballet dancer who... Before she ever became a, a famous ballet dancer, she was in her first class and she'd been signed up to it by her mother and she didn't really want to do it. And maybe in that first lesson, she tried it and she felt amazing. And she realised that I really enjoy this and I don't think I'll ever get sick of this. Like how I feel about music, for example. When I first tried music, because as, as an audience member, as an observer, as a listener, I love music. But the moment I tried to make music, or first picked up an instrument, I was like, holy shit, this is so much fun. But I didn't have the thought first. I had the feeling first. And then I thought, because it made me feel a certain way. And then the thought what, came what, after the feeling. What made you feel a certain way? Picking up the instrument and playing it and producing sounds and producing chords and producing melodies. We're just fucking around on a keyboard. Well, there has to be a thought process to no. get to that place in the first place. There's, a, in, there's a thought pro process. Is, you, just, you just picking up the instrument is a thought, as in there's a, a, yeah, yeah, there's yeah, a yeah. thought that leads to an action. Yeah, yeah, but there's no way of knowing how it will make you feel. There's apprehension and excitement. It's like going bungee jumping for the first time or going skydiving. That's what I'm saying. There's no way you know how, to, uh, how it will make you feel yeah, until but, you go into the action. Exactly, but unless the, the thought, the thought follows it. the feeling. Unless though. if you think about it. The thought follows the feeling. Unless if you, f the thought, the, the thought will. Put unless, yeah, but you're you're saying that, but you're talking about the other way around. That's what I'm saying. You're talking about the other way around. You're talking about picking up the instrument, yeah, and then getting the feeling from the experience, and then having the but, thought. But the right? feeling that you want to do more of it. Okay, but what if there was no comes after the, What if there was no instrument? Then you'll never know. But what if you thought it first, and you thought this this is a good idea? No, you can then have you feel it. You can have a good idea. Like the thought will put you in the situation where you'll yeah. try something. Or you'll do something. Or you'll win something. Then, or you win something. But then how does that feel? Well, when you, when you visualise it, it yeah. feels amazing. Or like holiday. You go on holiday, you book the holiday. You've never been to a country before. Yeah. Leading up to the holiday, you get more and more and more excited, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the days well, you, leading you up you before it, you get really, really excited, You feel right? things. You feel things. You feel excited. What I'm saying is before you've had the experience, you start to think about it, which produces the high emotion. Yeah. Before you get there, whether you've been there or you paid for it or whatever. Sure. It produces emotions, but not necessarily the same emotions as actually experiencing it itself. But we're saying before you experience, we're talking about the law of attraction. So we're saying before you experience something, how do you use the law of attraction to manifest the experience well, of something? You, so what you, That's what we're talking about. Sure. I'm not negating what you're saying about yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the way you've experienced emotion and thoughts and the process and how that yeah, works. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about in relation to the law of attraction, how that all comes together so that people can use it in a way that's actually beneficial to them that they can understand. Sure. So it's... In that sense, then, it's that you think about, you know, your, your mind wanders or you explore different avenues of thoughts. You lock onto something that makes you feel good when you think about it or the possibilities of it excite you or make you feel positive, you know. So when you know you're onto that, you basically hone in on it and you put yourself in a situation where you can actually do that. So you might think, I really want to go... Jim, 
gym, kite surfing, whatever it is, right? So you think about it and you can imagine yourself doing it. You mm -hmm. visualize it. Mm -hmm. You get a feeling and, from uh, that. Yeah, you get a feeling of, right. oh, I quite like that visualization. That makes me feel good. I feel like doing it would make me feel good. And it's almost like a, it rubs off on you. But the more you that, think about it, it leads to action, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you think about it to the point where you're like, I actually want to do this. I actually yeah. want to go through the process. Or you start so getting it, signs. So it's, it's, it's almost like a, a call to action. Mm -hmm. That feeling you get, from thinking about something that makes you feel good and you know it's like I'm not thinking I'm going to go slash that teacher's tires or something because or I'm, I'm going to go and break into it because when you think about negative things you can there's a part of you deep down on some level know it knows that it's bad but maybe you've resigned yourself when people focus on bad things it's because they're almost like well it's not a big it's not a big deal if I do bad things because there's not there's no value to me anyway or I've, I'm already a lost cause or that kind of thing they write themselves off but it never feels good to do something bad. You know, it can feel exciting, but you feel, you know, there's a part of you that's feeling, you know, your conscience, which is kind of like a fucking uh, guilty. Can you stop with the swearing? Like a guilty conscience, you know. So the point is. Yeah, is the it, point, please. The point is, is that if you focus on, if you focus on things that excite you and mm -hmm. make you feel um, positive about mm -hmm. the future, and you can see that it's not about stepping on anyone or screwing someone else over, but it's just pure positivity. It's just something mm -hmm. you're doing for your own pleasure and your own happiness. And you can appreciate that. Then thinking about that enough, it's kind of a spur to spur to action to make you go and put yourself in the situation where you pick up the guitar, where you go to the ballet class, where you go to the cooking class, and then you live it and you find, okay, this, this was everything I imagined and more, or, you know, this isn't for me, I need to try something else. But at least if it's a spur to action, that's the most important part about it. There's nothing else valuable about about the law of attraction apart from how do you manifest it? How do you use it? How do you utilize it? Because just thinking about it, it just seems like the biggest waste of time. But we both when you agree. Though, we both agree that the starting point is it's thought. Thought and emotion yes. have to be aligned. Yes. And thought has to be in the direction of what you want. Yes. And the emotion has to be a positive emotion towards the thought. Yes. In order for something to action, as in something to come of it. Like yeah. say you actually force yourself into action, so it starts. Something starts to happen. Or something comes to you as a result of your attracting it yeah. by doing those two things, yeah. Yeah. yeah so if yeah. we use that as a starting point, because again we could we could spend a whole show talking about that. And this attraction. is the thing I think this particular, you know, we've gone from something relatively guided with the show to something that is deep, very fucking deep, very well, with the very, swearing. It's very intricate. There's 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 absolutely a huge amount of subjectivity. And there's so many different perspectives. Yeah. And next, every, next time we'll do something slightly easier. Yeah, you know, every man and his dog's got an op will have an opinion on the on the secret and have an opinion on the law of attraction or whatever. Yeah. So it's, Guys, it's, it's leave it's, your comments below. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. you, you know Just that we don't agree below. on everything. As in, I'm not talking about us. I'm talking about these guys watching and yeah. us. Leave your comments below because we're open to new things and we don't get everything right all the time. Our truth is just our own truths. Universal law number four: the law of allowing. The law of allowing states, allowing things to move without resistance and to evolve and grow naturally. Okay. They talk a lot about allowing in the law of attraction. Sure. It's one of the steps. Yeah. Well, this is, yeah, that makes... You allow know, you, it, bruv. Allow it, fam. Halal it, bruv. So... Why'd you have to go there? I had to. I did. Couldn't help myself. Allowing, you know, you think of follow the path of least resistance. And it's like, if you want something, you can have a real uphill battle trying to get that thing. Upstream. So, okay, same principle. Yeah. Or you can I'm basically... I'm contributing, I'm building on what you're saying. Okay. I'm not negating what you're saying. All right. Uphill, upstream, same sure. thing. Yeah. Or you can try and figure out a plan, which basically, again, has the, has the path of least resistance. And go with the flow. Exactly. Um, and it's not necessarily like you're blindly just floating along the river and just letting the river take you where it wants to go. But you have an oar in your hand, but it's kind of like, how do you get from A to B and paddle in the kind of, you know, to persuade the river to go? Or you, you, you don't need persuade, to, that's the idea of allowing. The, craft. the idea of allowing is going with the flow. So rather than, basically it's against effort. If something feels like effort, then you're resisting. I think resistance and effort is a very different thing. I think it's a massively different thing. Go on. Because sometimes okay, you can no, put I, I, straight, away, straight away, as soon as you said that, I felt that. Yeah, I felt that. Yeah, because effort, I think we're talking about it from a different perspective. Go on, sure, explain first. Because effort is a prerequisite to achieving, even if it's mental effort and focus. 
or discipline okay. or attention or okay. hold it, holding your attention or something. That's effort. But the point is sometimes we put effort into things where the returns are minimal because we're choosing a path of resistance. And it, resistance is really, you're pu- you can have a certain amount of effort that you put into one thing or a certain amount of effort you put into the other thing, right? And if there's less resistance on one, you'll get more to show for you'll you'll get more out of your effort. Not necessarily to show, because not all of it's necessarily tangible, something you feel or development you make. But it's you get to where you want to be quicker than if you're facing more resistance. And resistance can come in many forms, but that's that's a different thing. Okay, so what I was saying was again I can't I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. Sure, sure. What I'm saying is is that when I talked about effort and resistance refine it what do you mean yeah, by being effort? related yeah 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 what do you mean by you go effort? to the gym you have to put effort in the gym to lift those weights sure or to run that 10k sure but that's a positive form of effort yeah because you're you've got a result that you're working towards that you're happy to achieve yeah happy to achieve it doesn't feel like work it doesn't feel like work the moment that it starts to feel like work that you're putting an effort in that feels like it's resistance as in it's against doing what you want to do or feel like doing. That's what I'm talking about. Resistance and effort being linked. Sure. I agree. It's quite interesting because they did studies where they found that, you know, they've been able to tap into something called the zone. They say when people are in the zone. Kanye said, don't let me get in my zone. Kanye said that. Kanye. <laughs> the zone. When he gets in the zone, he does some crazy Don't let shit. me get in my zone. I'm definitely in my zone. What's the zone? Sports players get into the zone, right? And they call it the flow as well. Yeah. Again, um, same thing, different term. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Or different understanding. Or yeah, exactly. Different expression of that yeah, idea. The same thing. So when you're... The way I see it is this, right? I'm zoning. Not even half of uh, after that drink. I'm still speaking. <laughs> you're not slurring either. Holy shit. So With the swearing. I'm not making any... It's, I'm going to swear. Just resign yourself to the fact. I apologize. <laughs> okay, so uh, when you're in the zone, you're it's so like bad, Chris. You can have the same task, and whether you're in the zone or not in the zone will mm-hmm. affect how much you actually enjoy doing that task mm-hmm. or how you feel about that task. Mm-hmm. So, if you have to do a calculation on a spreadsheet, mm-hmm. for example, if you start seeing it as a puzzle, like for some of my yeah. friends, I knew what, a what, positive what, challenge. Yeah, they see like the they see it as like a sudoku puzzle or like a crossword or you know a brain teaser where they're like oh i want to figure out this mathematical and the idea challenge. is the satisfaction of what you're going to get the end result exactly right but they're doing it for yeah they're doing it for an end result to to to, to solve the puzzle but for them they get into a zone of kind of rain man-esque kind of minority report tom cruise going through this information and they're not focusing on a they're not looking at the time. They're not thinking about how monotonous the task is or how the drudgery associated with the task. They're thinking of what they're building towards. In the same way, you can go into that task and not be thinking about it being rewarding. Or maybe for you individually, it isn't a rewarding experience. So when you go into that exercise at the outset with that feeling of, oh, do I have to be doing That's this? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Because some people look at that Sudoku yeah. and be like, I can't even be asked. Yeah. I don't know why people do this. Yeah. That's resistance straight away. If they're made to do it, that's resistance that they have to do it in the first place. Yeah. But like say, somebody that sees it as a positive challenge yeah. to broaden their mindset, to expand their I- ideas of what's how to do something or to overcome a challenge, that's a different kind of mindset. Exactly. So do you understand now what I was saying about effort and resistance? Yeah. yeah so yeah, when we yeah. go with the flow, we're against resistance, as you said. And there is no effort. Even if we're applying effort, it feels effortless because we're enjoying the process yeah. to get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But That's, the moment it's, we... It's about the feeling of effortlessness. Yeah. Really. And the moment we it's go against the, the flow, no effort in there. it feels it's like it's it hard work. Like... And if it feels like hard work and we're basically pushing against making something happen, yeah. we're not aligned with who we truly are and what we truly are. And we're not going to get the best out of the outcome. True. Because we're not in alignment. Because we're doing things that we don't necessarily want to do. In that moment in time. In that moment yeah. in time, yeah. yeah. And it, going back to your gym example, for some people, pushing weights and thinking about how you know, hench they're going to be at the end is a really, it's enough of a motivation to make them stick with it. But then on the flip side, someone might do weights and get really, really bored. And every time they're like, they think about it, it's like, I don't want to lift weights. It's just so dull and boring. But the fact is that there's so many forms of exercise that they might prefer swimming. They might prefer running. They may prefer skipping, you know, but there's something else which will make them feel skipping. differently. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Cardio. It's good enough for boxers. Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. Shit, I'm not going to knock it. 
So anyways, the point is is that just use the example of gym, of weightlifting isn't for everyone. But it depends on what your what your focus is on and the motive. if you do you feel motivated? Do you feel like do you feel motivated enough to have, to find the discipline to deliver on it, you know? And what your passions are. Yeah. What you are as a person focused towards. Exactly. And what you enjoy. Yeah. So it says here as well, the state of allowing is the purest state of manifesting. So again, that goes down the line of if you go with the flow, you're allowing to come to you what's meant for you. Yeah? Yeah, it makes sense. We like the law of allowing. When was the last time you allowed? Right now. Do you feel uh, taken advantage of? I feel abused. Universal law number five, the law of resistance. Oh. The law of resistance. Anything offering resistance will manifest itself into energy blockages or stuck energy. So this perfectly flows on to or from what we just spoke about. Hmm. So what does that mean to you, the law of resistance? I think it's more understanding and applying it with the law of allowing, which is, I think, as well, why this book has 18 laws in it. And in general, the universal laws, if you Google it, there's seven. I think she's just expanded on the seven and made her kind of own interpretations of those laws to give a little bit more clarity sure. to it. Yeah, yeah. So my, under, uh, my idea of resistance is acknowledging that there is contrast in something that you're going through or experiencing or an idea or thought that you have. And rather than going with the flow of it, and saying, okay, I accept this contrast for what it is. I acknowledge that it's directing me through my emotions and my thoughts into a different direction. Is actually staying in that moment or heading towards what you don't want. And you're basically resisting the outcome that's meant for you. Or the feeling better, the feeling good. Yeah. I know, I said a lot. <laughs> you always talk a lot there's yeah and there's a difference between constructive it's like the difference between constructive pain and destructive pain it's like if you exercise and afterwards you're aching and you're sore but you feel well like if you do a yoga session afterwards you're aching and sore but you feel quite well re rewarded like that's all of the muscle fibers that are broken they're going to heal back stronger and you're going to be better for the experience for it and that pain is a sign that you're healing and your body's going to be stronger and benefit from that experience. But then on the flip side, you could do some serious damage and like, there's no positive coming. I'm just, this is just pain. This is just um, non-constructive, you know? I almost, so feel, I think, I almost feel like this so, law is um, negligible. Yeah, fair I think enough. the law of yeah, allowing yeah. is more important. I think than it's law just an interesting, uh, d d d d I agree with you. It can be, it's, it's pretty straightforward. It's almost like it's a polarity here and we've already done one side yeah. and now it's like, we're just looking at the opposite side. Sure, but I think a lot of people, I, a lot of people they will also skim over it but they'll make a very common fallacy a very common logical mistake where they take all resistance and all pain as bad pain but sometimes there's growing pains there's the pain of there's the discomfort that comes with being outside of your comfort zone for example right there's that fear of will i be accepted will people like me i'm taking a risk will it go wrong there's that that comes with taking a risk and putting yourself out there right and if you contrast that with the pain of, for example, pushing away those who love you or d degrading yourself, those are destructive, you know, pains. But there are pains that come with doing the things that you're meant to be doing. And then you just appreciate those pains because you're like, this is a necessary pain in order for me to get, it's a necessary sacrifice, it's a necessary thing I have to put myself through in order to get to where I want to be. You know, it could be cutting back on luxuries for a month so you can save up for that deposit for a house or for a car, for whatever it is. And there's a discomfort there, but it's you're knowing that it's serving a better purpose. You know, I almost feel like this goes back to a conversation we had in the first episode when I spoke about the emotional world Throwback. being a I'm not gonna, I'm not going to do a cutback like flashback. No, no, don't. Flashback. No, I just want to say it. Um, when I spoke about emotions being a guidance system and like a compass, and that basically. The idea of resistance with emotions is that when you're feeling a bad emotion, it's, it's pointing you towards... But you still keep doing it anyway. If you, if, yeah, if you keep doing it anyway, it and you're putting effort into something yeah, that's Then you're resisting resistance. going to an improved place without maybe being aware of it. And people, again, will say, yeah, but how can I feel better when this and when that and when this and when that? Well, it's a choice. And again, it comes back to choice. You can change your circumstances, etc. But the, 
the idea of staying in an emotion and then feeling even worse or the same badness about it is resistance. And just knowing that energetically, it was talking about energetic blocks. That is an energy block mm. because you're not allowing your energy to flow back to where it wants to be or where it's meant to be, which is the positive side of the spectrum. Yeah. Well, this is where people say, oh, I can't change or my, it's a habit now. I'm just too ingrained. Where sometimes, oh, it's too late for me. I can't change my ways. Save yourself. Yeah. And Chris. 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 Where is Chris? They're all going to be saying, who's Chris? Where's Connie? Throwback so, joke, throwback joke. So, yeah, it's like, um, yeah, it's a clear distinction to make. Because some people, they like you're saying, with energy blockages, mm -hmm. some people get really stuck in a, in a rut and then they kind of wallow in their own misery or they kind of ignore the fact that they're unhappy mm -hmm. and they keep doing the same things, pretending that they are happy. Back or, to the Einstein quote. Yeah, it's denial, isn't mm -hmm. it? It's, it's a denial of how you're really feeling inside about your situation. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of saying, I want to change my situation and it'll take effort to do it, the, the, the thought process is to change the situation requires too much effort. I don't want to put in that effort or I can't see a way forward. But it doesn't, you know, sometimes it's just about sitting down and sketching out the options. Mm. Mm. You know, you have to you have to want to you have to want a way forward. You have to look for the options in order to see a way forward. It's not going to fall out the sky. But mm. You have to be looking for it, law of attraction for it to come to you. If you're just saying there isn't a way, well, there won't be a way. It's like that really famous saying, whether you believe you can do it, if you believe you can't, either way, you're, you're right. right. Yeah. So it's a little bit like that. But, but yeah. we're seeing already, we've only done five laws so far and we're seeing how they're all interconnected. Yeah. And again, we're understanding that you need to understand all of them in order to make any of them kind of work to your benefit. Exactly. And the more we can tie it to real world or pragmatic examples, mm -hmm. I think the better it is for, for this uh, experience. But let's continue. Universal law number six, the law of detachment. The law of detachment this is the law of releasing or letting go of your desire. Now, this is this is really interesting because the Buddha, I think it was the Buddha, or maybe it was the, who's that happy guy in um, uh, from China, I think, Tibet, that guy, Dalai Lama, Dalai Lama, maybe. <laughs> One of those guys. They basically said the root of all suffering is desire. Or attachment. Yeah, which is kind of yeah. what this is talking about. Again, I'm not sure if I agree with this. It says... This is the law of releasing or letting go of your desire. Okay, I understand it. I get it. Go on. What? I know what I want to say now. Say it. Okay, so the idea is, and again, this relates directly back to the law of attraction, which is why this law is so important. When you focus on something for a very, very long time, and we spoke about, again, being consistent in your thoughts, etc. But it's not about continuously, all day, every day, thinking about, I want to win that person's heart. I want to make this much money. I want to be healthier. It's not about continuously thinking those things. You have to place your thought and intention in a place and then leave it there. Go and do something else or work on something else or think about something else, improve something else. But then when you come back to the same thought again, take it from where it was and keep pushing it forward. When you continuously think about something or overthink something, doubt and fear and stuff generally human nature tends to creep in and you start to have other thoughts and that negates and sabotages your manifestation. Mm. So my understanding of the law of, is it detachment? Mm -hmm. The law of detachment is have your great idea, have your great feelings and then leave it there. Leave it there and then go work on something else to have great thoughts and feelings about. Yeah. But don't negate and don't sabotage your initial thought because your initial thought and feeling is the most powerful thing that you can have. I guess that kind of works both ways as well. If your initial thought is bad things, you need to change your thoughts. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you change your feelings. But if it's a good thought or a good feeling, hold on to it and then let it go. As in, let it go by doing distract yourself. That's my understanding. Okay, I like that. I like this. It's a quite an interesting way of seeing it. And then it's like some people get really tunnel visioned on what they want to do or achieve, and then it's to the detriment of all else. Or they they over try and they fail because they put, you know, they put too much pressure on something. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit like a relationship. I think of um, relationships when we talk about this because one of my favorite sayings, well, a lesson that I learned the hard way is that if you're in a relationship and you really love someone, you need to let them go because if they come back, drink to that. then it was meant to be. And if they don't come back, they were never yours to begin with. You know? Philosopher de Sonda. Yeah. So it's almost like if you put too much pressure on, you need this person in your life, that neediness and therefore that lack Mm -hmm. It's projected out around you yeah, and people. And neediness, no one likes you that. know, And it's like on Unless one hand... they're needy themselves and like attracts like. Yeah. Law of attraction. Then they're match made in heaven. But the point is, is that we oh, all know... Match made in hell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I wouldn't want that for anyone. But again, it's a learning yeah. experience, contrast. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes you get two needy people come together and they're like, oh my God, I'm the same as this person and I don't like the way the other person is or that aspect and about it. change. Yeah, that's yeah. sometimes yeah. an Which instigation. Which is perfect. Yeah. So, it's a little bit like when you really like someone and when you project that neediness, Chris, Chris when you project that neediness, um, it drives that person away, that your, your object of desire, right? But sometimes if you just come, whenever you have that encounter with good feeling, but no pressure on it, it tends to go a hell of a lot better. Because again, it comes back to neediness. Mm -hmm. Then it comes back to the lack that's implied by the neediness. Mm -hmm. And the lack is reinforced by the neediness. Because you're not complete thing. until you have your desire. Mm -hmm. no, right? no, no, wait, no, 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 I'm following You're the train wrong. of You're wrong. I'm following the train of thought. I'm following that process to its logical kind of or emotional kind of end. So you have neediness, then you have lack, and that reinforces you only have lack if you feel incomplete. And that sense of incompleteness is what's projected around you. And it's worth pointing out that people, as everyone knows, can pick up on that sense of neediness. It's probably also worth noting that the universe as well can. But again we should keep keep to it pragmatically and say that uh you can pick up when someone's, they need company or they can't be left alone or they need to be the centre of attention. So, and this again goes back to what we were talking about when we said about effort and resistance. So in order to win anyone's heart or to have a relationship with anyone, you do have to put effort into it in the first place. Yeah. But as soon as that effort becomes work or you're resisting because again, you're putting too much in, becoming needy, like you say, it completely changes the dynamic of the energy. The yeah. energy changes. So that's why even in relationships, you have to, again, it's like the thought or the feeling, you have to put an amount of energy in first to express your desire and then, like you say, let it go. Mm. And what comes back to you is meant for you. But you have to let it go. And again, that is perfectly, I think what we just spoke about is perfectly the idea of the law of detachment in relation to how, how can we use this or better understand this yeah. in our own life. Yeah. So again, when something doesn't work out for you, don't hold on to it. Let that go. Oh my swore. Let it go. <gasps> I know, I know, I'm PG. PG, Andy D, boom, let it go. Even the worst times or like, again, it's very hard, but like when somebody dies or when you get sacked and fired, oh yeah, but it's easy for you to say because, you know, no one died in your family or, you know, you still got a job, whatever. Okay, we understand we're from different perspectives, but if you hold on to that, you're in a very negative, resistant Where you isolate position. yourself and you... But like I say, that manifests into those things, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The moment you say, okay, you know what? I accept that it's happened and there's nothing I can do about it. And there is a sense of loss here, but don't stay in that emotion for too long. Yeah. Unless if that's what you truly are choosing and that's what you truly want to experience, you can move on and change as soon as you're willing to accept the circumstances. Yeah. And again, that comes to detachment. You have yeah. to detach yourself from what was to move into what is and what can become. Mm. Otherwise you'll be stuck in the older options of where you've been and no one wants to stay where they've been yeah, well it's kind of like being stuck in the past or looking for looking at where you are now and looking at where you want to be it's like ultimately you can be focused on the past and focused uh you know attached a lot of people it's quite funny because we're talking about attachment to desires which is almost a forward projecting thing or you're talking about desire is in you know just general wants mm -hmm. that you can't have that's currently in your life mm -hmm. but then there's things in our past that people like like mourning a loss or the loss of mm -hmm. a loved one or losing where you you wish for or you know maybe the, the the mourning of a relationship where you're looking back and wanting and desiring and you're attached to something from the past which holds you back but again like you're saying sometimes in order to move forward you have to accept forgive if needed and accept the situation for what it was and pay attention to what you're doing now and what your situation is now and the real question is which is sometimes the hardest one is where do I go from here? And sometimes... Or how do I change? Because I think, again, change, is it yeah. very ego-based where it's like the ego doesn't want you to change. So it ho tries to hold you in a position of where you are. Yeah. And then for you to actually make that conscious decision to change, to become something different, something else, it's very difficult because the ego is kind of holding on to you and pulling you back saying, but I don't want you to change. If because you change, things were better in the past you and we don't know what the future holds because it's risk. Yeah. It's basically, I was happy as a youngster. I had a loving relationship with my I parents. I don't want to grow up and get old. Yeah, or... Uh, you know, I loved my grandma, but she passed away. I miss those days when my, I used to spend time with my grandma yeah. and she made me feel good. Why can't I have that forever? There's an ego part. Why can't that be forever? Why can't I always feel that? I think good? it's tough for people to accept. That's what it is, isn't it? Yeah, it's difficult. Losing someone you love is always difficult, you know? 
but there's there's a healthy amount of mourning. There's a, of you course, know, of course, and you, that's there's, that's indeterminate. You can't say it's going to be a month or a week, whatever. Just that person knows. And you know, again, it's, it's, it's how much they can put up with as well, as in being in that space of mourning well, eventually or sadness you break, or anger. Even you know, you break. Yeah, and you and, switch yeah. because you, enough is enough, and you accept that. Okay, you know what? I can't do this anymore, or I can't be this anymore, and you have to move on. You have to change, and it might be because you're feeling it yourself, or because everyone else is sick and tired around you. Mm. I'm not talking about just specifically on someone dying in your family, or a loved one dying, or a relationship failing, or whatever. Whatever it is that you're putting out, eventually the people around you, like say, you become isolated because they either don't want to be around you, or they keep on saying. Can you stop? Can you cut it out? Yeah, yeah Enough yeah. is enough, like. Yeah, yeah. Or you do it yourself. Like you say, you say, you know what? I can't do this You self-isolate, yeah. And you realize that, you know what? I can be better than this. There was a time in my life without that person or without this thing or without that job. I can do it again. Yeah. I can find better even. And as long as you project yourself into, okay, you know what? I accept what's happened in the past. But now let's let's create again. Let's create something new. Let's create something different. Let's create something better. We don't know what's out there for us until we start to put our mind into that space. And then we can go and discover for ourselves. Yeah. Cool. Let's continue. Yeah. Universal law seven, the law of abundance. The law of abundance. There is more than enough in the universe. Nothing is limited. Again, I feel like because I've been studying this stuff for so long, I've come across so many sound bites and quotes and stuff. But straight away, this resonates with me and I get it. Let's hear it. You sure you don't want to go first? Teach me. There is more than enough in the universe. Nothing is limited. Okay. I'll give you the idea of oil they keep saying to us the oil is going to run out oil is going to run out oil is going to run out I'm, I'm not positive of the date i know i think there was one thing that was 2050 would it completely run out or something but i'm pretty sure that by 2020 or something there was going to be a scarcity and prices were going to skyrocket and all this kind of stuff but the idea that i understand from my way of thinking is that when there's a strong enough desire for something on a mass consciousness or a collective consciousness, that desire will be fulfilled by this reality. If we say we need to run our cars on oil, petrol, we need this. Somehow, some way it will keep being produced. Now, I know just using this as an example, I know but you could argue, yeah, but there's only so many dinosaurs or there's only so many plants and stuff that, you know, were compounded under all of that matter over millions of years that produced the petrol really we don't know this for a fact we're taught this we're told this that's a whole nother subject so you you don't okay so are you saying you don't believe there's a finite amount of oil i don't believe that oil was produced as we're taught it as we're told it's produced okay i don't believe that anything is finite okay which i, I know is a very complex idea but same with gold there's there's such a small proportion of gold as it is on the planet yeah but we still keep finding gold yeah but at this what is stage are we going to run out of something on this planet okay so one of the good things about this is that we can agree to disagree and we can discuss we have we we're different people we have different shots viewpoints. fired <laughs> there will have to be a sound effect there thank you I not, not on your thing, on my thing. She, yeah. I'm just going to do a little water gun squirt. <laughs> <laughs> In my eyes, there is a finite amount of certain material or physical properties. One of the... Yeah, you're talking about in physical reality. Hear me out. No, yeah. but you're talking about in physical hear reality. Hear me out, motherfucker. I'm not going to disagree me, with you on that. Cool. Okay, so at the end of... I'm going to say it quickly. At the end of it, you tell me whether you agree or not. So there's something called ent uh, entropy. So the thing about entropy is that everything in the universe is slowly decaying over time. Sometimes there's events that take place which create new systems of order. Or if you imagine like it... new that, stars being born. Exactly. Or new planets or new islands. So even though, for example, the water levels will rise... I come from or, the island. <laughs> um, or, you know, there'll be some new... Uh, Old islands will be submerged. New islands will rise from... Potentially, you know? There's, no one can really say which way it's going to go. But the point is this, is that the universe is moving towards entropy and moving towards decay. And everything is basically in the universe is moving apart from each other. So, we're gradually becoming more and more distant from the planets around us and the, our stars. And this is happening over millions and millions of years. But everything is spreading. Apparently. Spread, apparently. But everything's spreading out. The reason I mentioned entropy is because when we're talking about the law of abundance, 
to me personally, that means that, for example, what do we use oil for? We use oil for transport. Mm -hmm. So the real need is not for oil in this mm -hmm. instance, it's for the ability for transportation. Mm -hmm. So the abundance is not in the oil, which is just the means to the end. Mm -hmm. The abundance is in, in ways to achieve the end. So, for example, it could be like, like a Tesla uh, lorry that delivers goods as opposed mm -hmm. to... You know, uh, a petrol run or a diesel run lorry. So that's th that's the way I see it. It's not about the abundance of physical properties. It's the abundance of um, methods to achieve our ends. If you take music, for example, originally it was vinyl distribution, and then it was uh, tape cassettes, and then it was CDs, and now it's MP3. Then it was MP3s. Then it's now it's all uh, you know broadcast by streaming. So it's like the 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 methods of achieving a particular end can vary but the end of hearing music and enjoying music again vary. we're talking about it from the physical and non-physical point of view aren't we yes yeah so i would say i would say physical abundance doesn't make sense in the universe which is going towards entropy no, that makes perfect sense which is which is but, yeah, that makes perfect but in the sense. spiritual sense everything that you need spiritually or in order to achieve an end in order to achieve something those means are available but becoming attached to one means it's like saying you want to become a director and the only way you can do it is if you do a degree in it and say you don't have the funds available, you don't have university or whatever it is. You say, I can't do the degree, so I can't be become a director. That's rubbish. There's so many different ways to achieve that goal. There's so many different ways to achieve so many different goals. So I think that's what the abundance is, is that there are the resources you need. You just didn't like the example of oil, did you? No, because it, if it's a finite resource, it's a finite resource. It's wrong to say it's infinite, infinitely how you know, abundant. How do you know it's finite? How do you, know that, how do you not know that the... Um, the entire Earth's core is full of oil that we'll never ever get through in, sure. this, in this lifespan of humankind. Okay, but then it becomes speculation, right? Instead of speculating about something that could be, like there's an example of the flying spaghetti monster. Have you heard of that? No. Okay, so it's basically, it's the idea that... You just made that up. I, sh I kid you not. But if you're at home, Google it. And Andy, after this session, Google it. But the point is, no. is that people, to disagree with God, said... To prove what they felt they wanted to disprove God as somebody sitting on a cloud giving orders and dictating law to people. They said that imagine that there was like a teapot flying around the, the planet that was so small it couldn't be picked up by satellite. It couldn't be perceived basically. It can't be seen by human eyes. can't be picked up by satellite. But it's there. Prove it wrong. You know, and the point is, is that they can speculate about something that we can't disprove. And there well could be a teapot of that exact size floating around the world. And we can't say to them they're wrong. But it's a bit like Occam's razor, which is the simplest answer is usually correct. And the information we have at this moment on the planet, or what we've been told, which is a different thing, is that oil is finite. This is the structure of the composition of the earth. They could, it could all turn out to be a whole bunch of whatever it is. But... At this moment in time, with physical properties, unless proven otherwise, I will generally go with scientific consensus, unless there's a level of ambiguity or there's gaps around it. And even scientific consensus can be wrong. They used to, the, the scientific community believed that the world was flat for however many years. Uh, or let's, believed, not, let's not, flat earth is a whole nother episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Let's not even dive in. But I'm, I'm, my okay, point, my let's, point let's is... Let's move away from oil. Yeah, okay, Because sure. I think oil has put you off. Okay, low yeah, abundance. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I still, I agree with the idea, but I just, the way that I see it is that it's, there's an abundance of means to an end. So if you want to achieve something, there's an abundance of that. To, there's an, an abundance of enabling. And I'm saying paths. law of attraction states that like attracts like sure. and that we are creators. We manifest. Therefore, if we're manifesting our desires and there is a collective consciousness that has a mass desire for something, that something is created. You must have heard about the um, million kids that meditated and changed the crime rate in a certain country or whatever. No, I've never heard that. You dude. must have heard of the 100 monkey effect. No. I swear we spoke about this in the last episode. I wasn't paying attention. What was it? Just give me a very... The 100 monkey effect was the idea, something along the lines of there were some monkeys in Australia or something like that. This apple juice is really strong, you know that. And, <laughs> and they taught them how to break the shells off of nuts. Oh, yeah, and then the island nearby, the monkeys picked yeah, it up. And without talking. being taught it, yeah. But the next generation, it was in the consciousness, Okay. Consciousness is really important. And if there, if we believe or we, we're down with the fact that the law of attraction is, exists, yeah. it is a law mm -hmm. and it is present in our life. Yeah. 
if we then start to believe that everything is one yeah and it's responding to everything else in relationship form yeah. in relationships and we also allow we allow the impossibles to become possible sure if there is a mass consciousness everything is conscious as well so everything is responding to everything on different levels so a rock is responding to you but it's not going to chat to you and say all right bruv how's your day right but it's still responding to you on a different kind of consciousness level it would say his day is hard because it's a rock but dum bum crit desire is the most important thing with regards to creation creation it starts with desire which is a thought yeah. when it comes to abundance law of abundance is that what we're doing so i have to check this now law of abundance yeah there is enough for everyone oh. and if there is enough for everyone you can put that down two streams you could either say okay in the finite resources that we have we can share it all or the other term is to say we can create more of what we desire now obviously money is an that easy thing I don't to say disagree with. because money is something that we print we create that it's sure it's made up yeah same with music we can say yeah but when are we going to run out of ideas for music Will there come a day? Hypothetically, yes. Everything will be done. But I think that's so impossible to even conceive at this point in time with the amount of instruments and sounds that haven't even been made or experimented with yet that it can literally go on for a very, very long time. Sure. But going back to the law, the idea of the law is is that when you think of, this is going back to what you were saying about lack in relationships, when you go uh, down the, the route of lack and you're resisting the idea of abundance, you're preventing yourself from receiving the abundance of the universe, the reality, the earth, the people around you, the time that you have, everything that is in your existence. So the idea is, is that don't limit yourself. Sure. When everything is available to you, mm. it's basically you're going into a supermarket and everything that you want, money, respect, love, work, power, whatever it is that you want, it's on the shelves. You have to just go to the aisle and pick it up. But you have to believe it's there first and you have to have a desire for it. And you have to say, OK, I know they stock it here before you go into the supermarket. Yeah. Otherwise, you won't get it. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I'm saying. Oil maybe was a bad example. But one day when they prove that oil is infinite, then we can have another discussion. Well, this is the thing. I don't even wholeheartedly disagree with what you said about oil. For example, there are bacteria which it either there's bioengineered bacteria that either consume oil and produce sugar or consume sugar and produce oil. But the point is, is that there's... Nice a, way of covering your back. It's one way or the other. But the point is that there's man-made bacteria which were designed specifically to ingest something and produce something else as an output. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, is that there's um, limitless potential in... Limitless. In biotechnology. So... I'm not saying that's impossible to have infinite, what I'm saying is, infinite oil. Going back to oil, what you said though, about not if understanding you can, how a TV works, does it matter how we understand how it works by saying all this stuff? Well, well I think it, I think yeah, because it depends on who you think. It depends on who you're talking to. It depends on who your audience is. But I'm I think that, for you're example, a scientist? I think that there's so, people of scientific minds that could still get much a lot of value out of what we do without being turned off by, ah, oh, this guy's just talking out of his ass. You know, in fairness, there'll be challenges, there'll be haters, whatever, regardless. But the point is, is that I think there's a lot of the scientific community who would value from this conversation. from these conversations as well. So that's the reason I point these things out, to make these distinctions. Because Dora hopes that someone will write a paper on him one day. She is. If you're at university right now, think about it. <laughs> so the point is, for example, it may not be that naturally occurring oil is finite, but there might be opportunities to turn rock into oil or oxygen into or whatever it is okay but do you understand that that through desire is created so like you say there is a yeah. desire right so now for example someone might say we want more oil and then they come up they a well, we both know right we both know we don't want oil right like you say you said about the electric car it's about the means you said the tesla right? it's, a, it's, it's about it's, it's about we said we need to travel and you mentioned the tesla car being another option of transport like you said we went from uh we didn't say we went from coal trains to petrol cars if everybody on the planet wanted to have electric cars there would be a way to make them much more feasible, achievable, cost-effective, etc. that we could all get them. Sure. There's a lot of initiatives right now. To phase out. Yeah, in yeah, the yeah, world, yeah, yeah. right? Even in London, they're extending the um, congestion. It's not congestion. What's the uh, pollution? No, what's it called? Low emissions. Low emission zone. Yeah, to reduce the amount of... Out uh, further. Which means a lot of people will have to change their cars. 
yeah. in the next, I think, two years or five years. Which is something. not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing, but it's, it's moving us into a different direction of sure. the fuel consumption, right? Yeah. But I'm saying there was a massive desire that we need our cars and there wasn't any other alternatives at one sure. point. Yeah, because but when there was a electricity of, wasn't feasible. That's why. But when there was a scarcity of our oh, oils running out, whether they were lying to us or not, the idea that, like you say, it is finite, finite, Finite. 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 <laughs> it is finite and it's going to run out. They put the prices up, they make more money, blah, blah, blah. That whole idea to us is feasible, right? Yeah. It's, it makes common sense. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I agree that there's probably shitloads of oil in reserve. But then they keep finding they don't more make oil. It. They keep finding more yeah, oil. But they keep finding more oil. Yeah. Now, of course, yeah, technology yeah. evolves. We get deeper cutting machines, whatever, to go yeah, further yeah, in yeah. the earth or whatever. Yeah. We found ways to, what do you call it, pump out the oil in reserves that we couldn't get to before, etc. because technology has improved. Sure. But again, going back to the law, the idea is, is that if you want something and you want it bad enough and enough of you want the same thing, we can change the earth. What if everybody decided the earth was flat? I think the earth would be flat. Okay, let's use an example. I think this is like Minecraft and we're just basically creating it for ourselves. <laughs> I swear down. What if there is an animal that's gone extinct and everybody wants that animal back? Yep. Do you think it will come back, pop back into existence? If everybody, if the mass consciousness had a genuine, honest desire and a belief that it was possible that this animal could return without human intervention... I believe the universe will generate that. Okay. I believe the universe will create that under the basis of the universal laws. Okay. Not out of some magic let or some whimsical fairy tale, you know. I honestly believe that. Because let me put it like this then. There are, I, I reckon there are more people who have, or there are either currently more people or in the past there mm -hmm. were more people mm -hmm. who wanted peace over war. Mm -hmm. If you take the war in Afghanistan or going into Iraq. That's a good point. Yeah. Good so point. there was a lot of people it was the many against the few mm -hmm. in terms of, of points of view. And the many did not want to go to war. Yeah. So as a massive waste of money, massive mm -hmm. waste of life, misguided. Mm -hmm. Why put money into missiles when you could put it into hospitals and education? Or Are you talking about a, spe a specific we can, point we can in use, time? We can use uh, Afghanistan as an example. So this, recently. This, this, yeah. So it's the, most, it's the most recent war. I just feel like, I just feel like the world war might be more pertinent because it, it affected more people. Yeah, but no, I would say yes, but a lot of people wanted to go to war because they felt like they were fighting and they were fighting. Afghanistan to... was in the early 2000s? Yeah. I just feel like... But but World War One, World War Two, people, the, like the, the general public wanted to fight Nazism because of its, you know... Yeah, there's a desire, right? Yeah, because of that ideology, they wanted to defeat that ideology. So the average man and woman would be like, yeah, we need to take that down. But I genuinely feel that in a lot of countries, both West and East... Mm -hmm. When the Afghanistan war came onto the table, a lot of people, the general public, were saying, actually, we don't want this. And it happened regardless. So do you think not think then if it was in the general consciousness, that, okay, that no, idea being in the general yeah, consciousness? General consciousness, the idea of something being in the general consciousness against mass consciousness. That's what, the what if thing. it was? So what's mass consciousness then? So where do you draw the line? There has what to be it? a majority. What, but what if they were the majority? I don't think they were. That's what I was going to come back to you. When that was happening, how affected were you by that that every day every moment you were fighting for and wanting peace that's my first question how much effort did i go into you. fight what no you, you how much did you want to have peace a lot because every day i would be waking up and seeing no 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 no, no. How, well, how much did you action that how much did you make that happen well i was a kid at the time so there's only how old were you in the 2000s i was pretty young i was probably about 11 or 12 i don't think you thought about it that much i i did as a kid i really cared about it i feel like we were in that generation where in the Western world, terrorism was taken over and everyone was like, Ugh, because of 9-11 and all that kind of stuff, which generated Afghanistan, right? Or something around that timeline. 9-11 was the pretense to invade Afghanistan. Right. So obviously... Because bin Laden's from Saudi, but they invaded Afghanistan. For but he was reason. part of the CIA in America anyway. Yeah, and his Apparently. family had close links Conspiracy to... Conspiracies. His family had close links to the, the Bushes anyways. Okay, going back to the mass consciousness idea. When 9-11 happened, 9-11 is a good example. Right. When 9-11 happened... There's two, st uh, two satellites that run around the Earth. They're called Stereo A, Stereo B. Do you know about them? I've heard about them. I think okay, they measure uh, energy, a certain kind of energy. I think it's magnetic pulse or something, but there's a certain kind of energy around the Earth. Mm -hmm. When 9-11 happened, we had, a, it was, I think it was a dip. It was either a dip or a peak, but basically we had a massive effect on this reading that was pretty much consistent as far as I understand, or as far as my memory recollects. 
up to that point. And as soon as that moment happened, there was suddenly a wave around the world of a reaction to that moment because nobody believed that was possible and then it happened. Now, regardless of why it happened, how it happened, who planned it, all that kind of stuff. The fact is, is that human consciousness, human consciousness was affected on an energy level that was recorded sure. by these satellites. Sure. Right? When I talked about the world war, mm -hmm. because technology wasn't so abundant as it is now, and because, like I say, the agenda was different, but it did, there was a much more massive effect then. Afghanistan is a much more localized war as far as I'm concerned. And it wasn't, it wasn't even a war. I don't know what you understand it, but I just feel like it was the bully going in to pick on the little kid and getting what they wanted out of the country. Yeah. Anyway, using that as an example for wanting peace, when you focus on wanting peace, but still focusing on the war, that negates the peace. When you focus on the wanting peace, but you fight against the idea by pushing the agenda of peace onto the war, you're again fighting against peace. You're not going with the flow. So when we're talking about mass consciousness, and I don't know, I can't say, yeah, it's above 50%, bro. But when we talk about mass consciousness, we're talking about a majority, a majority of people consciously desiring with very strong, you know, emotional engagement towards an out, an out, an, an end result, an outcome. Yeah. Which I don't think in wars, because people aren't as attuned as they're becoming now, because we are going for a shift, people weren't attuned or have never been that attuned with wanting as much peace as maybe as the end of the war, for example. So at the end of a world war, when people are just, I think, getting sick and tired of this BS that's happening. And the rationing and the air raids. and the Yeah, because it gets to the point where they just basically they give up. Yeah, so it's, like it's giving exhausting. Up. And it's not giving up in the fight of the war. It's basically Conflict saying, I'm tired yeah. and I don't want to think about this right now. Even though it's happening, it's going on. It's almost like, you know what? I just release this. And the moment that allowing kicks in and saying, you know what? Can we just let this kind of disperse? I want to remember, like say the old times, whatever. The shift starts to move. Mass consciousness starts to change. But that moment when the war, the war starts, everyone's hyped up for it. I'm going to protect my own. I'm going to, you know, go in there with all guns blazing and stuff. So it's the mindset of, understanding that there's negative and positive they're two different things and you can't push against one to get it away because when you push against one it comes back and pushes against the other you've got to stand still almost in order to get as allowing in order to get that result that's what i'm saying i hear that. that's what i'm saying i'm not i don't necessarily agree but i understand and it's an interesting you lie to me a lot of times i said next law let's do the next law but you let's don't understand going. I, g I get what you're no, saying. No, you said you agree, but you what? You don't understand. I don't necessarily agree, but I understand where you're coming from. Abundance. The reason I say I don't agree is because it's not that I, it's not that I don't, com it's not that I don't agree wholeheartedly, but it's just that there is a lot of unmeasurable aspects about what you've said. Which is why I can't really... Okay, so this is going back to I what I said to you about I, the study of the meditation of kids. I can't... I praying can't. for peace or meditating for peace. And they affected the I crime like rate to, in a country. Should we bring it up? Because I would like to see the article on yeah. that. The laptop's uh, been here for a while. Mike, we'll get some That's use out it. of it. Go on, let's see. We well, have yeah. technology. <laughs> I think it was in LA, actually, that they did it. it they've done it in more than one place. Okay. And also... But yeah, the point, the point I was making is not that I just disagree with you for the sake of disagreeing with you, but it's just that when something know, can't bro. be quantified or measured or... But what if it can be measured? If it can be, then that's, you know, then that's a step in the right direction. You know? I'm not saying everything needs to be measurable, but what I'm saying is... You want evidence. I'm just saying that... I can't agree or disagree because there's no grounds on me. It's just two people talking subjectively. You know? Okay, we're just going to look at the first thing that comes up. I put in a one million kids meditate for peace and we'll see what it says. No, I don't think that's what you're looking for, mate. One eternity later. You see this straight away. I read this. Mass meditation may lower crime rate, study says. Now, again, if a million people meditated and all of a sudden crime went down, it doesn't necessarily mean that was the cause of it, right? Because those people that were meditating might be the ones doing the crime. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. But it's not likely that people... But it's, but um, is, it's it correlation is not... It's correlation is not causation. If it can be repeated, 
and the result sustained in more than one location in more than one time or whatever, yeah. then it becomes more factual or something. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. If it's repeatable, way. then yeah. If the results are repeatable from uh, from it, yeah. But again, it's it's correlation isn't causation, and it's like just because every time I lift my glass off the table, a car drives by, doesn't mean that they're linked. Doesn't mean that because I'm lifting my glass up, a car's gonna drive by. Twelve seconds later. Yeah, we need to do research before we do the show. Yeah. In the future. Okay. Because cool. like, there's a lot of stuff here that obviously will link to it, and eventually it'll come to. We'll come to it. Yeah. Okay. What I'm okay, but I yeah. So, up, but if you watch Ghostbusters too, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there's that the idea of that the slime underneath the city. Yeah. That creates a negative vibe, and all this BS is happening in the city because of this negative build up. Mm. So if everyone's feeling in a negative way, that's why you get bad places or run down crime ridden places because everyone's feeling crap but when you start to change mass consciousness if everyone was happy like the idea of um the buddhists well not the buddhists what are the people that live on the hill <laughs> the monks mountains. the monks are they what are they buddhist though aren't they they can be buddhist yeah okay so those those monks for example who they live a very sedentary lifestyle yeah, Tibetan monks that's what they call them rather than because if you just say monk you might think of a different kind of monk there's a lot Roman of different Church, there's yeah. a lot of different monks but so yeah I'm Tibetan about monks, the Tibetan yeah. monks yeah in sure. the uh, orange robes and stuff that, yeah, that yeah. study kung fu not all of them <laughs> racist <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah they live a very they don't fight you know as in between themselves they live a very peaceful existence until interfered with by other China basically <laughs> and that's what I'm saying about mass consciousness. When we all have the same idea about something, i.e. we agree on something here today, we're called to coexist in that moment mm -hmm. or in that, that belief system moving forward. But the moment there's conflict or resistance in an idea between us, we'll both go away thinking different things. So when there's harmony, mm. which creates balance in energy, then we have a much more positive result. And what I'm saying is that if we're all these powerful creators and we're thinking and we're creating and we're desiring things constantly, and we all have the potential to attract. If we're all attracting the same thing, then what's the likelihood of that same thing potentially happening? No matter how impossible it may seem, like you said about the animal that um, was extinct, if this reality is not what we understand it to be, but it's just what we're taught, but we have the ability to change mass consciousness towards a positive effect, and then we can prove it on more than one occasion, that's what would appease you, right? Then you'd say, okay, I get it, right? Because there's not enough evidence. That's what you're telling me, yeah? It's not even that. I think that the focus isn't on the... It's not on the means, it's on the end. Because it's... Like, for example, the mode of transportation going from petrol or oil to electricity, mm -hmm. it may well go to uh, hydrogen, which when you combust, when you burn hydrogen, the output is water. So you burn hydrogen, you get water. It's what they use to f fuel rockets. But it's just not been adapted necessarily that I'm aware of. It may well have been, but as far as I'm aware, they haven't adapted hydrogen to running cars. But if they did that, there'd be no, there'd be zero pollution. It'd just be producing water. 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 Right? In the same principle, I believe that the abundance is not of the mean, uh, not of, yeah, not of a particular means, but of, the outcome, towards the outcome. Yeah, it's basically like if you want to achieve something, mm -hmm. like if you want money, you don't really want... I want money. Give me your money. So money isn't ever for the sake of money. Money is either it's for... It's a means. Like, yeah, it's, a yeah means to an end. it's either to achieve you something or if it is for the sake of it, if it is just to say I've got this much money sitting in the bank account, that even alone isn't the real reason. That implies you want status and money is a means to status or money is a means to power. Or money is a means to control. But those things that ends that you want is really about that higher, that next step up of you've got money down here as a delivery system to achieve something such as power and control or property or influence or whatever it is. So really, it's the fact is, is that, that there's an abundance of different options where if you want to have influence, for example, money can give, can give you that. But then there's other ways. You know, there's... But you don't believe that consciousness can create abundance? I believe there Physical is... Physical abundance. I believe there is abundance in the, the options, the methods, the processes to mm -hmm. achieve ends. That's mm -hmm. what I believe. Okay. That's my personal belief. I do believe there's an abundance, but I believe it's on that. Mm -hmm. you know? Universal law number eight. The law of intention. Ah. The law of intention. 
Directing energy as intention is the first step of creation and desire, which results in manifestation. Let me just read a little bit more of this, yeah, just because this uh, one's a little bit different. I just want to pause on it, though. I just want to say I agree that it, the fact, the key phrase of that is first step. That's what I thought was interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why I thought, you know, let me go into this a little bit more because a lot of them talk about desire is the first step, but they're saying, no, before desire, there's an intention. Mm. But then how does that come in relation with your thoughts, you know? Because it's all kind of wishy-washy with regards to understanding how this whole formula works. Universal law is greatly underestimated. Not enough people pay attention to this law. Even if you forget everything else you learn in this book, this is the one chapter I highly recommend you pay very close attention to. The law of intention dictates universal energy can and will be directed by intention. This kind of goes back to the stuff we've already been talking about. Hmm. Universal energy is directed by your mind, your thoughts, and your thought patterns. But then isn't that the same as desire? What's the difference between desire and thought? Desire and thought. How can you have a how can you not have a desire without a thought? How can you not have a desire without a thought? Like you desire something through your thoughts. That's what they just said anyway. But then in the top they said intention is the first step of creation and desire. Unless if of course you observe something, then you have the thought about it, and then you respond to it. Intention like you is see the a fire. First, you're right. Say it again. Intention is the first step of... Intention is the first step of creation and desire. I understand the creation part, but the first step of desire, unless it's saying it is the first step, intention is the first step. But it doesn't say of desire, it says and well, desire. Well, desire, you could... The, look, the, the, again, they're kind of wishy-washy because if you say desire to someone, there's so many ways that word can be appropriated in terms of like... The, the standard textbook definition, dictionary definition of desire, there's so many different ways you can apply that word and so many different contexts. But from the sound of that, it sounds like intention consistently applied is desire. Like an in you could have an intention of, I want some apple juice. But if you sit there and focus on your intention of you wanting apple juice, you start to desire the apple juice is, an, is how I take that. So is a thought conscious, as in, is a thought when you can hear a voice? Uh, I would say no, uh, not always. I think that I would say not always. So what I'm saying is, can a thought be like, say, I'm looking at the... the you have subconscious thoughts I'm looking the at the, the apple juice. Yeah. The, the whiskey. Yeah. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm thirsty. I could, I could drink that without actually saying those words or, you know, having that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the intention of that feeling comes into my mind. I see it, then suddenly my desire kicks in. I want it. And then I have an intent to drink it. Well, let's put it like this. I think I think intent comes after. Like I just feel like intent comes after. Like desire comes first, then I have an intention to fulfill my desire. Again, the words are really broad and ambiguous in that respect. But if you wanted to make that make sense, you could say that the intention is that looks nice, I want some. And then if you hold on to that intention, you want some. It gets more powerful over time. And that powerful aspect of your intention is the desire when you're desiring something you might see a beautiful woman walking across the road and you might say why does it always come back to women because it's just me isn't it so you might see a beautiful woman across the road and you're like i would it'd be nice to talk to her your intention might be oh, i should talk to her it'd be nice to talk to her nice to get to know her and then the desire the more you focus on that the desire becomes i really want to i really should and it becomes it just becomes more emphatic becomes emphasized so you could say desire is emphasized intention but sometimes you have these desires and intentions without even consciously thinking about it it's a little bit like think about how many people go into autopilot myself included where you're working all day and lunch is almost like a background activity in your mind where you're focusing on the tasks at hand but you know that you're going to go for lunch because you're starting to get hungry but all of that whole conversation in your head you're not sitting there thinking am i hungry yes should I eat? Yeah, you're not going through it in a explicit, conscious level. Um, because you're conditioned. Kind of level of thought. Yeah, no, it's conditioning, yeah. yeah. But then it makes life easier because some things we condition into ourselves to become back. The same thing is like a, it's like an automated process, like breathing. You don't think, do I need to breathe? Am I suffocate? You know, your intention is just subconsciously is that. Intention is that I need to breathe. Desire is to breathe. So, yeah, that's one way to make sense of what, she's written there in the book
So she's actually gone on to say what does intend actually mean? And her explanation was it means to direct the mind or to have in mind the purpose or goal with the intention of a specific outcome or desire. Yeah. So you focus on, you, just, you see the glass, you focus on the glass, it comes into focus. and So the, the intention really is related to thoughts then, isn't it? Yeah, but thoughts are not always conscious. They are conscious thoughts and they're yeah, subconscious, subconscious and conscious thoughts. But yeah, what yeah. I'm saying is it still comes with a thought, thought first, thought then turns into a desire. To direct the mind, if you're directing your mind, that's the thought process. Not, it's not always conscious. Sometimes but, but, direct... But subconscious you, thought process. It's something you train yourself to do. But again, at some stage there was a thought that becomes a subconscious thought that again directs... No, sometimes... Give me an example. Give me a tangible example of when you can direct your mind without thinking about it. No, no, it's not that you consciously... You can, you could, your, your mind can be subconsciously directed, is the point. By? By so many things. By? Uh, for example... A good example is the basketball play uh, basketball players playing in the court and then the gorilla walking behind your attention youtube it guys is available your attention is on the people playing basketball because you were told how many times does the basketball switch between the certain color players or whatever exactly but even team. if you made a conscious effort to ignore the basketball players mm -hmm. if you're watching that video on the first instance they will still be the thing that you'll end up paying most attention to just because they're the most eye-catching I don't think so. No. As in, as in, I think if you're not told initially yeah. to be counting, as in to be focused on something, which is basically them directing your mind, and you're just watching it for the sake of watching it without yeah. being told or reading anything, you would see that gorilla because it stands out so powerfully and so strongly. Yeah. When you're told to focus on something, that you're almost being challenged again, like the Sudoku puzzle. You're being yeah. challenged that I don't want to get this wrong, so I'm going to yeah. be really focused on making sure because they do try and trick you as well with the passing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I will be focused on this to make sure I count only when they do the passes or whatever. Mm. That you, you basically push everything else out of your mindset, out of your view of uh, attention yeah. in order to get the answer right, to uh, satisfy the challenge. That's why that comes into mind. But here it says in, it means to direct the mind. So again, direct I your think, mind. I think consciously direct your mind. Intention is to satisfy the answer of I need to count how many passes are done. And then you miss the, oh, did you see the gorilla? No, you didn't tell me to look at the gorilla. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, but you look like a fool now. You didn't see the gorilla. Yeah, but you didn't tell me to look at the gorilla. That's why I didn't see the gorilla. Shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> or to have a mind, have in mind a purpose or a goal. My goal is to satisfy the need to actually get this right and to count all the passes. But again, my thought is that first before it became a desire. My thought mm. is, okay, I know what I need to do. My desire is to get it right. I think they're all too closely interlinked. They are say, very interlinked. Yeah. But they're and saying I think here, it becomes like a bit of a... Blur. Uh, yeah, that bucket of goop, they're all blending This together. is one of the most powerful laws, if not the most powerful action law of all of the universe. The masters of the universe. <laughs> He-Man. The law of love being the most powerful non-action law, which will come to at um, a certain stage. Mm. So again, intention, thoughts, desire. We're still saying the same thing though, as in, if you want to use this law to your benefit, you need to know what the intention is, and then you need to direct the mind only towards that intention. For yeah, the outcome or the yeah. purpose in mind is what they're saying. Yeah, I think it just comes. They're so closely interlinked. It's just about mastery of all three because they're so closely yeah. interlinked. Which is why I said I think she's expanded the seven into more, but they yeah. all kind of do correlate. Yeah, like master your thoughts, become master of your desires, and master your intention. Learn how to focus and you know laser, laser pinpoint accuracy on your intention. Or, or bullet what you focus. Want. I like to call it bullet focus without no wind. <laughs> There's always wind. Because when when the it's not avoid, when the bullet leaves the when the bullet leaves the gun, it doesn't go. Ha! Huh, let me look over here. It says, "No, nah, I'm going over there where you just pointed me." That's it. It's boom. It's gone. Almost like a laser. Almost like a laser. Almost. Which is why I said that's my analogy. Yeah, right. Should we move on to the next one? Because I think that one, like I say, it correlates and it's so similar to the other lots. Yeah, yeah. That is like we've we've, we've kind of covered it yeah? in so many different ways and okay. so many different examples. Universal law number nine. Number nine. The law of action. The law of action. Action must be taken in order to result in manifestations. We spoke about this as well. Yeah, I think that's the most important thing. <laughs> <laughs> to me, that's well, the important thing. Because you can have all the intentions you want, but if nothing comes out of it... I see. I think the intention is the most important thing. As in, if you don't know what the intention is, it doesn't matter what action you take. Again, there's a saying around your, that as your well. Your results will be... Like yeah. you, you, unless if you know where you're going, you, you might not get there. Yeah, true. Or what's it? There's a saying... I always wanted to be somebody. 
I wish I was more specific or something like that. Yeah, no, I, I, I get the gist of that. You're paraphrasing, but yeah. yeah. Something like that, yeah, yeah. So the law of action is basically thought, desire, intention, belief, faith, positive emotion, and then some sort of action has to precede those initial steps and stages. As in, it has to turn into something. Part of the manifestation of the intended outcome, yeah. the end result is you actually put in some effort into it. Like the relationship. If you desire somebody, yeah. They're not necessarily going to come over to you, especially if you're a man. I'm stereotyping. It's handcuff season, ladies. So you have to put some effort into guiding your intention towards the lady yeah. before something can come back. And that's action. If you want to win the lottery, you can't win the lottery without playing the lottery. Yeah. There's an action involved. You've got to be in, in the game to win it. If you want to build muscle, you have to go to the gym or exercise. Yeah, if you yeah. want to be healthy, you have to eat healthier food. As in, there has to be, after the intention and yeah. the thought, there has to be well, this is the correlated th action. You're touching on something here which... Oh, sorry, that was your knee. Yeah. <laughs> I, it wasn't, I was going to comment on the knee thing because I was enjoying it. But the point is, this is something that a lot of people mess up. I don't mean to put people down in general. I don't mean to cuss anyone out. But a lot of people mess did, this up massively. Did. Because you know what it is? It's because some people think I want to be a good Christian or a good Muslim or a good Hindu or a good Sikh. <sighs> Touchy yeah, I'm subject. getting there. I'm going Touchy there. I'm subject. going there. But this is the thing, right? At the end of the day, whatever your system of belief is, what comes out of it and what actions do you take on the basis of your belief? And the fact is, is that if you've got a belief system that makes you do bad things, or you use, it to, you use it to justify doing bad things, that defeats the purpose of the belief system. What, what good is it bringing into your life or the, the, the life of the loved ones around you or to civilization? And it's like, oh yeah, you know, break a few eggs to make an omelet. But it's really like, what are you manifesting from your belief system? What is your belief system justifying? And, you know, I think it doesn't matter whether you're an atheist or agnostic or um, spiritual or religious but the fact is that what is the fruition? What comes out of your belief systems? Like you see maybe a lot of um, uh, Bible thumping Americans who are very, very, um, uh, they, you know, they say they're Christian and they're really religious, but they pick and choose which parts of the religious doctrine they want to believe in. I say this just for the record. I'm Sikh of culturally background. I'm Punjabi. That's that's my background. But the point is, is that I've studied different religions I have no weighting or preference towards... He's a theologist. ...towards particular religions. But my point is, is that you can't say you're a Christian and then say, I'm not going to pay attention to the part where he says, love thy neighbour, turn the other cheek. As in you're saying all or nothing, you're saying, either yeah, do I'm, it or I'm, don't do it. I'm saying that, you know, they always say, um, they argue whether Jesus or Muhammad... This is one of my favourite sayings. They say, people argue over whether Jesus or Muhammad was the last messenger of God or the true prophet or I whatever it is. Yeah. But the, the real question is... Did you get the message? Cat Williams. Did you get the message? It and it's so true. Cat Williams said that. Did he? Yeah. That was a whole um Well, well respect to respect to that. For, I don't for care. You like say I don't care what they said. Did yeah. you get the message? Yeah, yeah. And that's what people skim over and you're gonna bring it up. I have to. Yeah, I rate it. Yeah, put it up because it's um Keep talking. Oh it, yeah, so have you seen these wristbands? Um what would Jesus do? Christians used to wear them back in the day. No, Rubber wristbands. No. So basically on that philosophy, as in that ideology of what you're thinking, I came across this thing that said, before you do something that is obviously of concern to you that you've never done before, whatever, ask this question first. If everyone did it, what would be the outcome? Yeah. And the moment you put yourself into that perspective, rather than just thinking, yeah, but if I do it, what's going to happen? If you think about, okay, if everybody did what I'm about to do, is it good or bad? Then straight away, you kind of almost innately gut instinct come up with an answer. Yeah. And another good saying that I like is, just as it's related, is that fighting for peace, because a lot of uh, religious people will say, oh yeah, you know, no, I believe in the good parts of the religion as well, but we have to protect ourselves from either cultural change or from conversion or from outsiders and blah, blah, blah. I'll always say this, I'll say fighting for peace is like having sex for virginity in the name of virginity. It's like you'll never get peace from war. You know, peace is never the result from war. War just creates more war, more conflict, more sorrow, more, more, more pain. Um, but yeah, so the point is, is that 
in terms of action, you know, intention and action are so closely linked, so closely related. You know, your head's probably in this shot and just ruining it, your big ass forehead. It was, it was Eddie Griffin, sorry. <laughs> Eddie Griffin's quality is all though, he's sick. Shall we? Yeah, let's do it. I'm just going to skip to the part where he says that he's probably going to do a little I don't go to that. church. God don't live in church. They say the body is the temple. I'm walking in church right now. Uh, he's very clued up. He's very, very soon as you go to church, there's somebody trying to stick a dick in you and they need some money. Okay, I'm going <laughs> to skip a little bit. It's only five minutes, man. I said let it play out. It's five minutes of our podcast. But like you say, it's about the message. Just let it play out. It's, uh, I'm hoping it's the right part. Okay. He just blessed me with this house. I'm sure he wants me to live in it. Everybody fighting over this religion shit. You understand me? The Christians say Jesus is the messenger. The Muslims say it's Muhammad. I say, who gives a fuck who the messenger is? Did you get the message? That's pretty much exactly what you said. Right? Yeah, that's it. Yeah, it might have even been. After it probably was. It probably was from here. Yeah, but once it's in your in your um, consciousness, yeah, it just from, it's just for something that you always remember, right? Yeah, because it, it resonates. It makes so much sense. And it's not it so much sense, doesn't yeah. it? it and so that's the sense. thing about action as well. So I think intention. You're right. Intention is just as important. Um, they're both two sides of a coin. F both fundamental aspects of something that they're both uh, required for anything for you know um, a purposeful constructive outcome you know especially if you're looking for personal change in your life or to change the lives of those around you who you care about so yeah so that was law number nine law of action happy to move on yeah one more for the road minimum okay universal law number 10 the law of cause and effect yeah. now i think this is actually one of the original seven laws don't quote me on that the law of cause and effect every action has a reaction or a consequence the law of cause and effect dictates that for every action there is a reaction or some kind of response i think everyone can relate to that yeah it's yeah. kind of given but i think it's being aware of or being conscious of if i do this what we just spoke about if i do this what are the ramifications of my actions? And if you can put yourself into that mindset of, without overthinking it, of, okay, this might or that might, how can you intend or direct your thoughts toward the one outcome that you do want, the effect that you do want? Yeah, yeah. We move on. Because cause and effect is... It's self-explanatory, isn't it, I really? think very, uh, very understandable. It's very accessible to anyone that's conscious. Did you know that the, uh, the average reading age in the UK is, do you know what it is? I don't know. As in reading age. Have a guess. What, when they learn to read? No, 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 no. As in the ability to read. Yeah, yeah, when they first learn to read. It. No, the, no, the ability to read at a level, at a certain level. I don't know. Not when you can read. So um, reading age is like, for example... Eight, nine? Over the UK. Yeah. It's nine years old. Yeah. So a lot of people that are... Let's just say watching television. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of words that are being spoken that they don't even know the meaning of. Yeah. And then there's you busting out of all these big man words. <laughs> Nine. Google. Nine. Google. I that. would love to see how they actually measure the level of reading and like, well, how can you define me as, you know, I'm not going to say how old I am, but imagine, <laughs> imagine, how, but imagine like every year what you're meant to improve, you're meant to get better. Like, how do they do that? Now, of course, Early ages, Reading comprehension. Yeah, early ages, I can understand that. Yeah, yeah. But then after that point, is it, okay, you need to know 100 more words to get to that level? No. Let's not go into it. It doesn't work like that. Uh, let's not go but into one it. interesting thing I found is that they were talking about teaching philosophy to children because they found that it helped them make better life choices mm -hmm. as they grew up mm -hmm. because they had uh, more critical thought about the things that they were doing with the people around them. So it's not that the kids are necessarily unable to grasp the concepts. It's just that they need the building blocks because anyone, any, any, any lingo that you need to, or any industry you need to get into, or any job you need to, there's basically that base concept of certain words that they used, and they're just speaking a different language almost. 
So you just need to learn the language in order to make sense of the concepts. But I think, you know, sometimes I, you know, use whatever... Big, big man things big man words but the thing is that just google it because there's so much information out there and there will everything be everything is accessible to you now yeah yeah and even there's in, no excuse there's like s the simplified guides just to break you into it and, it's and for all you that aren't aware you put define d-e-f-i-n-e -E, and then the word it'll come up it'll yeah. come up yeah, yeah yeah define define that do you want me to allow that move on let's do it okay universal law number 11 the law of pure potential cool the law of pure potential everything and everyone is one of infinite possibilities. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Ooh, like the oil. Everyone. <laughs> We're all one, bruv. Universal law number one. Oneness. We're all one. We're all connected. People. Oil, oil is, no, it doesn't say people. It says everyone. Yeah, but one is personhood. One is a thing. Not everything, everyone. <sniffs> don't do this, don't do this. Big man words. <laughs> <laughs> The law of pure potential is truly underrated, if you ask me. I'll skip down. The law of pure potential dictates the possibilities of what a person can become and make of their life are not limited in any way, shape or form. True. In any way, shape or form. True. In any way, shape or form. If I didn't have legs and I want to be a runner, and it says I'm not limited in any way, shape or form, you are going to go against that? Get some cyber legs. Bam. Job done. Oscar Pistorius style. So we're talking uh, the shooting, physical still, like we're talking wife, physical, huh? right? We're not saying they can grow legs again. We're saying there's other ways around it. Again, other means. There's other means to achieve something, okay. yeah. But then that's not to say that that particular physical means won't be addressed. Like you've got people growing stem cells. Um, for anyone who's interested, pluripotent stem cells. So basically what it means is you can take some skin cells, scrape it off your arm, put it in a little Petri dish... And then they do some stuff to it. They've done this in Japan. They put some chemicals stem in Stem cells from your arm. So what happens is, I think... What is a stem cell? I thought stem cells came from the uh, spinal area. Uh, from the spinal area and from embryos and from fetuses. But you just stuff. said scrape it off your arm. Yeah, I'm getting there. So that's where there's cells, they're prototype cells. So they're cells that can turn into anything. On your arm? What, no, in the fetus and in the okay, embryo. Yeah. So right? the arm... So the arm, what they do is, you can take cells from a different part of the body. To grow another arm. Let me finish. You, you I'm, can, I'm curious and excited. You can take cells from a part of the body, apply certain chemicals to it, certain um, methods to it, and what it does is it turns it back into a stem cell. So a stem cell is of infinite possibility, or, you know, of a wide range of mm -hmm. possibilities. A stem cell can turn into an eye cell or turn into a skin yeah, cell. Saying, like the, or liver or heart cell, Every right? cell has a DNA of the entire body. It's been a long time since it's, but it's coded, so I can't really... Or it's directed towards a certain part. Because when you think about it, when does a I'm finger ignorant. know when to stop growing? Huh? As in, uh, when does the end of a finger know, okay, this is the end of the finger now? End of a finger? Um, because there's, there's in the a DNA, map, there's, 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 there's a, a map DNA, of the body there is a structure, in, in the DNA. Yeah, there's a yeah. structure in the DNA which is encoded into every cell in the body. That might be right. That then but the, the tells it. But the is point is, is that it needs to be a stem cell, a pluripotent stem cell. No, but you're talking is, about, yeah, you're talking about to actually grow in the lab. Yeah, but I'm saying that even, I'm saying. even as a fetus, fetus, a fetus um, and an embryo have high levels of these pluripotent stem cells, mm -hmm. which go out and say, okay, what jobs need to be done? What needs to be created? And they go and turn into arms and legs and teeth and nails and hair, blah, 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 blah. So the point is, is that you can take cells that already have got a job and you put that in a Petri dish, do some stuff to it. And they go back to... Do some stuff to it. Do some stuff to it. Mix it with some chicken lava. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bit of a... Uh, so and pepper. I was going to say KFC gravy, but you know. Um, and basically, it takes them back to their early stage of they can be any cell in the body. Mm -hmm. So then what happens is you influence them to become any cell mm -hmm. in the body and you grow that in a culture. So that way you can regrow, you can do skin grafts, for yeah. example. So if you have third degree burns, you take some cells from another part of the body. It could be hair or I don't know, some other part of the body. Turn them into pluripotent stem cells. And it's fasc absolutely fascinating. And you can basically regrow organs and uh, they're building up to that. And specific to the person as well. Yes, so there's no which rejection. Is, yeah, which is why I never understand, like, for example, when people start losing their teeth as a very basic one because we're all going to lose our teeth. Why do we just don't grow, regrow our teeth? They're talking about that. They've actually found, it, they've been able to do think, it in yeah, mice. I was going to say they're, that. They're testing no, it. No, I think, I, think, I think somewhere in the world they are talking about the possibility now of regrowing teeth and actually doing it. But I'm talking about on a mass uh, It'll be f uh, f commercial. Ten, 10 to 20 years. You know, why aren't we doing it yet? Yeah, because they're doing all... Testing the, and stuff. Yeah, just to make sure yeah. that people don't start f 
we're getting weird about it, like growing extra limbs and stuff. I don't know. But yeah, so it's in the works. It's in like in the idea of infinite possibility. What was the what was it potential? Was yeah, that, was that what it was? Potential? And then you were saying everyone um, and everything, and I'm saying it's everyone, not everything. Okay, so pure potential starts again with the thoughts, right? The thoughts, the ideas, the desires, the beliefs, the intentions, right? If you want to be something, you want to do something, you want to have something, you first got to get that in line and that attuned before you bring it into the idea that, okay, everything is, again, back to abundance. Everything is available to me if I put my mind to it and believe that it is possible no matter how impossible it might seem. Okay, I was going to talk about Robert Bannister. You know Robert Bannister? No. Robert Bannister was the first man to Invented run the banister. The four minute mile. And until that point, it was impossible. And they said it was impossible. It can't be done. Mm. No one's ever done it. It can't be done. It's impossible. And then all of a sudden he comes along. This is like the hundred monkey effect. He come along and did it, proved everyone wrong. After he did it, other people started doing it in a very short time frame because now they believe it's possible because someone else did it. Yeah, yeah. Same with um, this hundred hundred meter running thing. Usain Bolt. What's he done? Nine, I can't even know. Nine point something, right? But the idea is, we're like, you how, how can they get any faster? How can they get any faster? But in our lifetime, we're probably going to see eight seconds. How is that possible? Because someone's got to do it because they're like, well, I believe I can do it. And they will train and they will work and they will make it happen. Again, where's the limit? The limit is the potential of our minds. Our minds are saying, uh, no, that's not possible. Or, you know what? This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And then keep trying, 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 trying. Uh, and there's no trying. Do or do not, there's no try. That's what Yoda said, Star Wars. <laughs> it's probably not Scott Star Wars. Yoda. Empire of the... I don't even know which one it is. I don't watch those films. Don't lie to yourself. I know that's the quote. Though, you've, got, you've got Chewbacca in your Do or do not. <laughs> do or do not, there's no try. <laughs> but they will do it as in like... I've got a difference of opinion on that. Go on. Because you're limited. You're lackful. Okay. Take your mask off. <laughs> I will, I will superimpose something on there. Chris, hey Chris. <laughs> what, guys? Yeah. Progression, it starts from, say you've got a 10 second uh, achievement of 100, uh, 100 meters. 10 second. Whatever okay, it was, yeah, 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 100 yeah, meters, yeah. yeah. You've got yeah, 10 seconds and then somebody takes off a second off of that. Then okay. somebody takes a half a second off of that. So basically, as you get closer and closer to the limits of the human body, which I know you hate to hear the word was limits, as you get closer and closer to the limits of the human body, that decrease in that amount of time will slowly shrink. So whereas it would have been a second, oh, the, he beat the, the the world record holder by a second, or he beat him by half a second, or he beat him by 200 milliseconds, or he totally beat him by... So that, there, there will be an increase, but mm -hmm. it will slowly shrink as we reach yeah. the limits of the human body. Um, and then there will be certain technologies like, oh, maybe if you eat certain foods, it, it increases your... Um, explosive strength it's in like the, the muscles, fast twitch fibers, or the long tail. Yeah, it's uh, it's more like cells. a um, like say a, yeah, like that. It's like that, <laughs> or like that. <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to that and be like, what? So basically, it's a bit of a curve like that where it it's kind like of that. it levels out. Yeah. But what you're talking about, so again, it comes. It, you know, a lot of the things that we think we want are really signposts to something. It's like money as a means to an end. In the same way, why does anyone want to achieve a five second, hundred meters or whatever it is? It's one thing to be the best at, in the world at something. It's another thing to say, I'm going to violate the laws, the physical laws of the of the universe to so achieve are, something. Are, because really, you don't need, what difference does it make if it's five seconds at the end or three seconds? We are limited by physical laws, what you're saying. That's the statement you're making, right? Which I think we can hold that as a pretense of, in physical reality... That is true. In physical reality, there right. is a limit. But the thing is, is that it doesn't mean... But then what about the idea of holding your breath? Because David Blaine held his breath for like 19 minutes. Yeah, but he was doing and that was some ridiculous. Sly, I don't know, man. David Blaine, these magicians, they do some really warped... Um, they violate the laws of uh, physics. Don't say the, physics. They violate physical laws. But you can't say that. Because a law is a law. You can't break a law. Well, this is the thing. It, you know, again, it depends. They on, push the boundaries. It depends on if you believe. But in, it still falls within the physical law of, like you say, the brain needs oxygen. It depends on if you believe in magic or not. It's not magic. Okay, so if no, no, no. This was a magic. This was a proper stunt. This was a stunt. It's the same as deep sea divers. You no know, deep sea divers that so hold do you their think, breath. Do you think pearl sea divers? Sorry, huh? Pearl sea divers that do the same thing. They hold their breath to go and search for pearls, and they can go underwater for extended periods of time longer than me or you can by many, many. I want to see this. Bro, I want to see it. I've never. 
David Blaine or deep sea uh, pearl deep sea diver? divers like pearl, pearl, pearl divers pearl diver um, record or something breathing breathing let's see because they would have done some research into no one can hear you when the microphone is pointed at your shoulder yeah yeah uh, uh, pearl divers breathing record I just want to but that's see where what like people up. like David Blaine had the idea to do the stunt in the first place there you go free okay. diver free diver 22 Hel minutes 22 minutes now you can barely hold your breath for two minutes bruv and he did 22 minutes yeah and that violates the natural laws of the body but it can be done when you push the boundary and you believe I will slow my metabolism down I will increase my what do you call it hyper hyper what's it called were you taking as much oxygen as hyperventilate hyperventilation they talked about that here he said that he hyperventilated before he did it yeah of course which works David Blaine looked at sticking a, a thing inside him to pump oxygen that's disgusting him. yeah but he, like I say he was trying to do the magic route of basically illusion illusion creating the illusion of it but yeah unlimited potential well no like one it, no one would even why would you even think about that like right now you didn't even think about that oh let me see if i can hold my breath longer than anyone on this planet and someone's gone and done it because that was their field that was their passion that was their interest but also they uh, want to see do you know how they do how it I can go. so basically it's a little bit like what the monks do so it's all to do with slowing everything down yeah yeah where basically, like for example, monks can monks. increase monks. Monks. Buddhist and Tibetan monks can adjust the temperature of uh, their extremities, the fingers and their toes, by a stupid amount of degrees. Where they can, you know, be out in the freezing cold, out in snow, in very little clothing, and melt ice, just ridiculous, you know, just do mad stuff. Boil water. I think there's one example, just some really weird stuff. Um, and it's all about control of the nervous system, control of the body. So a lot of the, you know, the, the stunts with the free diving is saying that they're able to slow down uh, their heart rate. And basically their, their body almost goes into hibernation where they're not actually using as much oxygen while they're alive. So because the use of oxygen goes down, mm -hmm. they don't actually need to... In they can but get again, a lot more out of that just breath. Just the idea of holding yes, that it's crazy. It's for that period mental, of time is a yeah. conscious thing, is a thought process thing. Yeah. And again, there must be a, such a strong desire to do that. Yeah. That they push the possibility, the potential. But for the, for, for the Buddhist and Tibetan monks, I think it's a, it's a byproduct, obviously. Of? Of the meditation and the spiritual path and of enlightenment. energy. Yeah. That that level of uh, energy control. It's like when they body. break bricks and do stuff on yeah, nails. Yeah, and, and stuff, they like right? put a spear on their neck and they lean it, into yeah, it and yeah. all that crazy stuff. Yeah. So that, that those are all byproducts of the spiritual journey and that mm. level of self mastery they're going yeah. through. And with the free diving, that's just one aspect of it. So you can cut away and cut back. Find a good take in. So that somewhere. that was the first eleven universal laws from Jennifer O'Neill's book, Universal Laws: Eighteen Powerful Laws and the Secret Behind Manifesting Your Desires. If you've read this, leave your comments below. Please leave us your comments and your thoughts on... <laughs> I'm covering your face, isn't it? You are, yeah. Please leave your comments and thoughts on what we spoke about today and give Hold us it up like that. your contributions as well on what you might think about what we spoke about today because we need to learn. We are still learning, sorry. We don't need to learn. We are always learning, right? Yep. Amen to that. Some people are more modest than others, of course. <laughs> We're always learning, so please leave your comments below. Episode... One is available here. That's going to be my shot. Episode one is here. Subscribe here. Do the same quick. Other way. <laughs> I feel like I'm about to do something like that. Part two will come another day. Episode three will be something different. We out. Peace.